Majority Report with Sam Cedar. The destiny of America is always safer in the hands of the people than in the conference rooms of any elite. Sam Cedar. They are unanimous in their hate for me, and I welcome their hatred. We must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. The Majority Report with Sam Cedar. <laughs> Ever get the feeling you've been cheated? It is Monday, May 20th, 2019. My name is Sam Cedar. This is the five-time award-winning Majority Report. We are broadcasting live steps from the industrially ravaged Gowanus Canal in the heartland of America, downtown Brooklyn, USA. On the program today, Peter Dow, author of Digital Civil War, Confronting the Far-Right Menace. Also on the program today, Deutsche Bank whistleblower reveals that money laundering red flags were triggered by Jared Kushner in 2016 and in 2017, but never reported. Interesting. Meanwhile, Republican Congressman Justin Amash calls for impeachment. Those calls are now officially bipartisan. Meanwhile, Trump is in a manic state over Iran. One day I like him, one day not so much. And uh, Democratic Governor John Bell Edwards, governor of Louisiana, will sign what may be the next, more or less, abortion ban bill. And uh, to celebrate Memorial Day next week, Donald Trump may pardon more war criminals on that day. Literally. The EPA planning to lower the number of deaths from pollution by changing their calculation of what constitutes pollution. That's the power of positive thinking. There you go. Science, folks. Meanwhile... Kamala Harris announces a plan to force pay equity. FCC greenlights T-Mobile Sprint merger. All this and more on today's Majority Report. Welcome, uh, ladies and gentlemen. It is Monday. Uh, We are now officially one month away. I think it's exactly one month away from the first Democratic primary debates, right? Um. They are going to be on a uh, Wednesday and Thursday nights. Uh, I believe it's uh, June 20th and 21st, 26th and 27th. All right, I jumped the gun a little bit. We're a week away. But so what? I'm very excited about it. (laughs) The debates, they're coming. They're going to be on the stage. They're going to argue. Oh, my God. (laughs) Get the babysitter. Get the beer. The debates are happening. We're going to get the beer. Um, Almost definitely. I've already checked. I do not have the kids that those two nights, so it's party time, ladies and gentlemen. Party time. It's like one of those, uh, one of those cartoons. Prepare. With, with we will be going live. Car. We will be going live uh, those two nights. We will do the same in July during the debates. Uh, do you and, have your string so cheese on. kids and your phone? So okay, bye. <laughs> exactly. I'm locking the door. Don't answer it. Do you re- do, Have you memorized daddy's phone number? Good. Now forget it because it's debate night. Right, exactly. Um, folks, just a reminder, you spend one third of your life in, uh, in your sheets. It's about time for a betting upgrade. I should tell you, um, Saul, almost basically done with uh, his issues with uh, soiling the sheets. So I may. Don't as a, it. I, 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 and almost, almost. 
I may as a um, as a reward get them a, a set of uh, Brooklinens. Usually they have been um, they have been just in the adult purview, the adults that appreciate uh, quality sheets. This is named the winner of the best online betting category by Good Housekeeping. Brooklyn and has more than 35,000 five-star reviews. This is because by eliminating the middleman, working directly with the manufacturers and customers, Brooklyn and offers luxury sheets without the luxury markup. With over 25 colors and patterns, these sheets don't just feel great. They look great, too. Uh, I now have at least four, um, four sets of, uh, of Brooklyn and sheets. Uh, it is a function of of the uh, living arrangements and the uh, post-marital uh, state that I'm living in. It's still New York state, but, uh, and um, I am loving every one of them. They're the uh, classic, um, I can't what they call them, the percale cotton, I think it is. I don't know. I'm not sophisticated about that, but I know what I like, which is the, cl- the classic crispy, cool cotton sheets. They're fantastic, and they, they make me look like I'm an adult. Very attractive sheets. My Brooklyn sheets are the best. They're the most comfortable sheets I've ever slept on. Now it's time for your upgrade. Brooklinen.com has an exclusive offer for just my listeners. Get 10% off your first order and free shipping when you use the promo code majority at brooklinen.com. Brooklyn is so confident they're, uh, in their product that all their sheets, comforters, towels come with a lifetime warranty. The only way to get 10% off your first order and free shipping, use the promo code majority at brooklinen.com. That's brooklinen.com, B-R-O-O-K-L-I-N-E-N.com, promo code majority. Brooklinen, these really are the best sheets ever. Okay, so uh, this happened... It's graduation time, as you know, uh, around the country. And um, this was uh, one of the, probably the best speech in terms of what uh, folks thought uh, around the, uh, you know, uh, or I should say students uh, considered uh, at their uh, graduations. This is um, a guy named Robert F. Smith. He's a billionaire. Don't know how he made his money. Private equity. equity. Great. (laughs) Um, Put that aside for a moment. Think positively uh, just for a moment. He is addressing uh, almost 400 graduates at Morehouse College. I assume he's uh, he's an alum there, right? Because he well, you'll you'll sense it from the uh, speech. Pretty sure he's an alum. Maybe he isn't, but uh, he's challenging other alum. Um, Nevertheless, he has an interesting announcement to make to the. 300 some odd 300 almost 400 kids uh students i should say at uh at morehouse on behalf of the eight generations of my family who have been in this country we're going to put a little fuel in your bus now i've got the alumni over there and this is a challenge to you alumni this is my class 2019 And my family is making a grant to eliminate their student loans. <laughs> okay, yeah, I mean, oh, you man, look at the people behind, news. behind, uh, you know, the, I think it's a uh, faculty on the uh, on the dais just going like, whoa. Um, apparently, uh, chance of MVP <laughs> were. Uh, um, were uh, chanted after that. Uh, there were people who, um, obviously very, uh, excited. Um, uh, they're not quite, it's not quite clear how much money that is. I've, I've seen stuff like 10 to, uh, $40 million worth of debt, uh, that, uh, he'll be paying off. Um, but nevertheless, um, it uh, the, the challenge probably should have gone out to others besides the alumni, but let's hold on that for a moment. Let's hear how Fox News, Fox and Friends did, um, uh, talk about this, because I remember when Elizabeth Warren talked about relieving everyone's college debt, not just the, the lucky people who happen to be sitting in that um, 
uh, that audience, they were very, very skeptical. I've heard stuff like, well, people won't appreciate the value of their education or it's not fair to other people who have had their, uh, who've paid off their debt. Uh, or just largely, why shouldn't you have to pay for it? Let's hear their perspective on this now. Well, this guy, James Allen Grant, was uh, exhausted. He said, I've listened to his speeches since 6 in the morning. He's 22 years old. But then all of a sudden, when they made this announcement, he looked at his dad, who's a banking examiner, who was going to work for another 10 years to pay off his $45,000 in debt. All of a sudden, his dad says, I basically retire because of, of what that gentleman just did, Mr. Smith just did. <laughs> what would you, how would you feel, though, if you were the, you'd already paid it? Or your parents had already paid it? They'd be like, shoot, yeah, I know. shouldn't Could've, have paid it. Well, that's, it. that's losing the spirit of it, Ainsley. But I'm just saying, you know, this, he could be practical on it. He just set up grants for it. I think it's great. He also said one of the keys to his success in life. All right, pause it for one second. Let's just stay there and, and go back a little bit. So, I mean, just think about the, the implications of this. You're talking 380 people. One anecdote already. One guy says, I can retire. Like, I'm going to be able to fundamentally alter the, the, uh, the trajectory of my life. Uh, because now I can retire. Now, for those people who didn't have a parent who's going to work an extra 10 years to pay off their debt, think of what they're going to be able to do now. Options, like, I mean, I wonder how many of those 380 uh, students, let's say, are now saying, like, uh, I'm changing my plans. Like, I may now go into teaching. I may now go into social work. I may now be an entrepreneur. I may now be able to take care of my, uh, my, my grandma, whatever it is. Um, we're going to see, I mean, and I, I mean, apparently, I mean, I was saying this would be, uh, this is a, a social scientist's, um, uh, you know, uh, best, best, uh, you know, dream come true because you're going to be able to track what the choices the class of 2019 makes as opposed to 2018 or 2020, 2017, 2021. I mean, you're going to be able to check this out. And uh, apparently AOC uh, beat me to the punch um, yesterday. To be fair, I didn't see it yesterday. Uh, but she said this could be the start of what's known in econ as a natural experiment. Follow these students compare their life choices with their peers over the next 10 to 15 years. I mean, it's it will be stunning. And uh, so now, of course, I don't expect Fox and Friends to get the idea like, hey, this seems like a great thing to do for these 370 kids. If we have the ability to do so. By taxing that guy who can just like throw it off like, hey, look at me. <laughs> I'm just doing this. I'm a billionaire. Um, we could tax those people. Elizabeth Warren has her uh, wealth tax plan. Bernie has a plan. We could tax these people and do this for tens of thousands of people a year. We could do it. But they don't quite get it. Meanwhile... The um, stumbling on and just not quite getting it doesn't just stop there with this segment for the Fox and Friends. Here is, uh, what's this guy's name again? Brian Kilmeade. Oh, yeah, Kilmeade. Um, here he is also stumbling into the value of another government program that was controversial that i have no doubt he would be against today in retrospect and certainly at the time but uh here it is he's talking about that billionaire robert smith <laughs> but i'm just saying you know this, he could be practical on it he just set up grants for it i think it's great he also said one of the keys to his success in life was the fact that when he was in denver they bust him to a predominantly white school carson and, uh, carson school and this was where he met the best teachers most inspirational mm -hmm. people along with having two parents with phds yeah that's the school choice it's so important how wonderful is that okay first off <laughs> let me work uh, wow. let me work uh, backwards on this that's not school choice. That's not school choice. When you hear school choice, that's not the program that we're talking about. That's called busing. 
busing was a very different program than school choice. Now, I know Kilmeade, when he first looked at that casually, was like, oh, this is going to be my opportunity to talk about why white schools <laughs> and white people are better than other things. I'm not going to get too deep into this. I'm just going to point it out that the white school was the best. And what he doesn't realize here was he is making an argument not only for forced busing, forced integration, but that there are how many Robert Smiths and Roberta Smiths are there? That back in that generation and generations before them and following them who don't have access to what those kids in Carson have are sitting there real, with completely unrealized potential, not just to make a billion dollars, but to cure cancer, to just be a really good teacher, to, um, you know, uh, a whole host of things. It doesn't matter. Live a decent life. Live a decent life. I mean, in that one segment, he pointed out, one, the value of a free college education, two, the fundamental inequity that exists in our public schooling and our schooling across the country, and how, it, how government has the ability to fix this. And completely all of it just went by and he just saw it as white schools are better and uh, billionaires can be really good for society. Yeah, he got to hey, go to white schools. Credit for being to the left of Joe Biden on this issue. I mean, really stunning. I had to ask my friend, Mr. Smith, who's given me money from his private equity pack in the past. Why the hell are you going easy on these black millennials? I met Peanut in the pool in the 60s. That was hardship. Yeah. Oh, you can't get a job and you're up to your neck in, in student loans. I don't care. I wonder if there's anybody at Thank Fox you. who goes up to Brian afterwards and says, hey, Brian, I mean, uh, do you know you just basically came out and praised busing? What's busing? Should that <laughs> exactly. be my next book? Exactly. Should I write a history of busing? Because I'm a historian. Yeah, he's still in probably the not, Brian. He, he's still in the 1800s. He hasn't worked that far. Yeah, he's got to work that way out. Hey, uh, folks, whether you're trying to get a sweet deal on something or find the best happy hour in town, what do you do? You read the reviews first. So why should finding the right software for your business be any different? You can read thousands of real software reviews and find the right software for your business at captera.com slash majority. Captera is the leading free, free online resource to help you find the best software solution for your business. With over 850,000 reviews of products from real software users in more than 700 specific categories of software. From project management to email marketing has everything you need to make an informed decision fast. Join the millions of people who use Captera each month to find the right tools for their business. I mean, I don't, I, I, if I was advising uh, Captera, I would tell them too, there's also value. Just go and find out what software exists. Yeah. Never mind what's the best one. Like there is no doubt in my mind, there are people who are listening to this who have businesses or contemplating businesses and have no idea that there's actually software out there that is tailored to those businesses. Uh, I go through it, like I say, and it's like just sort of my, um, uh, what do you, like your dreamscape? What's that thing where you put it? You it's cut my pictures. vision board. Yeah, my vision board of all the things I'm going to do after I, uh, and after I, after I just walk in one day and I go, sleep and just I watch F the it. Debate. Michael, you do this. Bye. I'm going to, uh, I was, all, I was all over Captera last night. I got four different careers I'm about to follow right oh, I'm going to run an Airbnb. There you go. And I've got Airbnb software that I have, uh, I mean, or B&B bread and breakfast software that I got, uh, that I found on Captera.com. Uh, check it out. Visit Captera.com slash majority for free today. Find the tools to make an informed software decision for your business. Captera.com slash majority. That's Captera, C-A-P-T-E-R-R-A. Dot com slash majority Captera software selection simplified. Also, um, I know many of you uh, may think that you don't need life insurance yet, but if you have loved ones who depend on you, you need to have a plan. Um, many excuses not to get uh, life insurance, folks. 
too busy, too costly, don't know how to um, uh, wade through it, don't know anything about it, don't know the difference between term or whole. And I do not give advice on this stuff. I will tell you, I got term just because I read online that was the, the best deal ultimately. You get it. Uh, I basically got it for, uh, uh, until my kids will be about 25 and 30. So that they are at least through uh, college. And um, it's important to do. And thankfully, Ethos makes doing the responsible thing easy. With Ethos, you can get covered in 10 minutes online and even si sign up right from your phone. No pesky paperwork or pushy salespeople. Just put, choose a policy that fits your needs. And don't waste time deciphering the fine print. Ethos treats you like a person, not a risk. They work to make sure you have the right policy for your lifestyle and budget. They have a dedicated customer support team right, right here in the USA to ask with any, uh, help with any questions you may have. Visit ethoslife.com. Click check my price to get started on the quick online application. Ensure your life today by going to ethoslife.com slash majority to apply online. Sharing your life and providing your family with financial security has never been easier. That's ethos, E-T-H-O-S, life.com slash majority. And you're only 10 minutes away from your estimated rate. Make sure your family's future is safe no matter what. That's ethos, life.com slash majority. Quick break. When we come back, we'll be talking to uh, Peter Dow on the digital civil war. Be right back. We are back. Sam Cedar on the Majority Report on the phone. Pleasure to welcome to the program Democratic activist, author of Digital Civil War, Confronting the Far-Right Menace, Peter Dow. Peter, welcome to the program. Great to be with you. Thanks for having me. All right. So um, let's, uh, let's, let's start with the, the, the book, but I want to also, you know, circle around to sort of obviously like your... Um, uh, your your online um, activism and, um, and and to a certain extent civil warring, but I guess maybe quarter war uh, on some mm -hmm. level. Um, but let let's just talk about what you see. Well, let me let me start with this: Is there a digital civil war, or is there like a civil war? I mean, obviously, we're not having a an active uh, war with. Well, I mean. Uh, mass killings and and whatnot, but um, I mean, to the extent that there is a a civil war at all, um, is it just digital or 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 what? Well, the reason I settled on digital, and as you may know, Sam, I I grew up in an actual civil war in Beirut, right. so I've actually lived through a military conflict for for most of my youth. Uh, I, I, I struggle to think because, you know, the, the idea of a civil war is really when you reach a point where you're no longer debating in good faith, you're no longer even seeing the same reality. You're at such odds that really it's just a fight to the political death. And then I really ask myself, because a lot of people have used the term cold civil war or soft civil war or uncivil war. And I thought that it's really not those things because people are dying and lives are on the line. And then I realized that the battles are really fought online, but then they spill out into the non-virtual world. For example, a lot of the, <clears throat> excuse me, the mass shooters 
recently uh, have come have been radicalized. I'm talking about right wing extremists, domestic extremists and, and terrorists have been radicalized on on online forums from YouTube to 4chan, 8chan, Gab, other places in Twitter. And then they go out into the non virtual world and kill people. That's one way that it's, 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 it's digital because they're actually getting radicalized there, but it's spilling over. And another way is these massive battles that we have, say, over um, the caging and, and the kidnapping of babies that, you know, the Stephen, you know, President Stephen Miller's policy, I call him President Miller on, on, on the border policy because he really calls the shots. Uh, that is a life and death issue. Kids are dying. They're being thrown into freezers and, and locked up in these detention cells that are, that are ice cold. So healthcare, the universal healthcare battle, people losing, losing their healthcare, every single one of these fights has life and death consequences, and yet they're largely fought on digital battlefields. So that's why I settled on digital civil war. Okay. I mean, it's, it's um, the, uh, the concept of the non-virtual world uh, is, I mean, I mean I, I'm afraid that like that's more or less the way that I look at things, but I feel like that's disturbing on some level. But um, the uh, as opposed to uh, you know the the virtual you know it being the virtual world is the uh, but, but but that aside, I mean I, I mean I, cause I'm just curious because it seems to me that like we have a legitimate um, rift in this country uh, that has certainly been exacerbated over the past really, I mean, uh, not just three years, but I, I would say, you know, 15, 20, you, you, you know, I mean, uh, you've been in, involved in this uh, area at least, you know, for that long. Uh, you know, I, uh, in many respects, um, you know, we were back in the day during the sort of the, the, the blogger era. Um, exactly. But the um, like this, I think is I think there is something real here in that it is um, that. Social media, which has exploded. I mean, well, let's put it this way. Uh, it, it has been just another outlet for it. Because, like, do you think that this uh, this civil war, and again, and, and I want to touch on just uh, how you were raised, because I think it was just, it's an unbelievable story. But um, but but you were there during the, the, the era of just the blogosphere, and we had some hint of what things were going to be like today online, but it was different because it was just not as, um, frankly, in some respects, it wasn't as, as democratic or as easy to engage. Um, Correct. How, just tell me how it's changed since then. And if, if it's not just a function of like, there's just a new arena uh, for the same conflict or if there's a different conflict. That's a great question. That's a, that's a really good question, which is, has the digital technology actually changed the nature of the conflict itself? And, and, and there are some who have argued that. I, I quote some people in the book who talk about how warfare has gone digital and on all sorts of levels um, on an international basis. Um, if you look at what Russia did, it was it was a digital, it was a cyber attack on our elections. But yeah, yeah. You and I go way back to the to the early era of, of of just the beginning of blogs. I remember when blogs were on the cover of Time magazine, like the the big new thing. This was pre social media, so I've actually seen the entire evolution of online politics and was there at the very very inception of it. But it 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 it, it took hold very quickly, Sam. And you remember back during those days bloggers were starting to have a lot of influence. And of course, it has been democratized and expanded and anybody can get online and, 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 and talk and fight and argue and debate. For me, it is really the same battles. Uh, and part of what I did in Digital Civil War is to go all the way back. If you look at the, the I call it the first civil war, if you go back to, the, to the, the mid 1800s and really to the inception of this country, issues of race, issues of identity, who's the real American? Is it a white rural Christian male? Is that the quintessential American? That's one of those myths that has started from the founding of this country and continue to this day. So those types of battles, the, the abortion fight, immigration, have gone on for far longer than digital technology. So, so I think that the technology has, has expanded the field of battle and added more people to it. I don't know that it's really changed the nature of the fights. Right. I mean, as you go through in the um, uh, y your various chapters, I think deal with themes that that everybody who listens to this program w w would recognize, whether it's climate, uh, whether it's a question of how much money is spent in campaigns and in, in impacting 
um, uh, the legislation, uh, the notion of, of real Americans, I mean, particularly people who, uh, and enemies, uh, enemies of the people. I mean, I think, you know, a lot of that also dovetailed, uh, you know, uh, in the, uh, the war on terror in those first years after 9-11 when uh, the blogosphere really uh, first to grew, I mean, I think largely as a function of the technology that was available, but also the, the complete lack of, of access to the media for anybody coming uh, from the center left, leftward from there. Um, right. I mean, that's really a lot of where, like, it seems to me a lot of this grew out of, in many respects, was that, that combination of technology and a complete shutdown. There was no, there was no Air America. There was no MSNBC. There was no HuffPo. There was, there was none of that stuff. Yeah, no, exactly. And, and you've been doing it a long time and you've been on the front lines of this, trying to uh, promote and advocate for progressive media, but it, it is true. There was no outlet. There was nowhere to go there. I remember the early message boards like democratic underground and then the first blogs and the chat rooms and communities that it was, it was a way to get a voice out. And then, and then I remember when Howard Dean first started rising in 2003, you know, we're talking about uh, elections a lot now. And I'm trying, I'm thinking back to the first election I was involved with, which I ended up working for Kerry, but Dean started tapping into that, what we call the net roots at the time, that language of that really in your face, proud, unapologetic, progressive language. And he exploded onto the political scene by doing that. So, yeah, it, it, it was an outlet. That's an absolutely good point. And, and of course, we have more outlets now, but I still think there's this myth that the corporate media is somehow liberal. And, and this, is the, this is what the GOP pushes and the right pushes, that somehow Fox and Talk Radio and, and Sinclair are somehow a counterpoint to a so-called liberal mainstream media, which is, is utter garbage, frankly. Mainstream media pushes right-wing talking points just as readily as, as conservative outlets do, or I shouldn't even say conservative, right-wing outlets do. All right. Well, let's talk about. I mean, I I, I want to talk about the um, the uh, the the 2016 and sort of like how you uh, because there has been you've had a big I think public um, um, reassessment of mm -hmm. of of your role in the context of I mean I guess maybe like a different civil war was that a civil war like you know where what. During the, the, the primary uh, battles, and I tried largely to stay um, out of uh, those uh, specifics. I mean, I was supportive of Bernie, but um, obviously in the general of, of, of Clinton. Um, but the, a lot of people got sucked into it super deep. You were one of those people. <laughs> um, yes, I was. T just tell me about that experience. It... <laughs> Looking back on it now, uh, I can see how I did exactly what you're saying, which is get sucked into it. I, I've been describing it as a, as a family fight because largely, uh, I think a lot of people who were in the same place or generally speaking were looking for the same type of America where people had more health care and there were fewer shootings and there was uh, less inequality ended up getting on different sides of two candidates and it became, as, as you know, as we all know, so incredibly bitter. Um, but as, as somebody who you know, grew up in a war and, and once you're in the trenches with somebody, you, you stay in the trenches with them. I sort of became that person in the trenches with Hillary and I just was not going to abandon her in the middle of the fight. But what that ended up doing is I think making caricatures of a lot of us. And we, we just, we just went so far in the direction of, of fighting that fight that I think um, it just ended up hurting and causing more pain than it, than, than it really needed to. Primaries can be con contentious and can be negative, but I think 2016 just went off the rails. And I, and I, and I do believe there, was, there were outside agitators, professional agitators that made it a lot worse. But I decided, Sam, that I just wanted to take responsibility for myself. I can't tell other people how to feel, and I know there are some people who are annoyed with me for we're going through this, this, this transitional phase and reassessing my role, but it's something that I felt I had to do because number one, I felt that I started getting so far away in terms of how people saw me and things people were saying to me so far away from who I was, which was as, as I know, you know, cause we've known each other a long time, a progressive anti-war activist. I started in politics cause I used to be a musician 
fighting the Iraq war and fighting Bush and fighting uh, Karl Rove and Cheney and those people. And so for me, it reached a point where I thought, okay, wait, am I seen as some DNC shill who's just uh, being paid to just parrot some establishment uh, line? I thought, well, I'm, I'm, I'm anything, but I'm the exact opposite of that. I was brought into the Democratic Party to reach out to the progressive community. So part of this was my own personal realization that I, the perception of who I was had moved so far away from who I am that I needed to reconcile that. And the way to do it was to start reaching out to people and just saying who I was and making amends. What, was there was there a moment, and, and I understand too, and, and I ask these questions um, because, I mean, I, I've had uh, problems, frankly, with people who uh, wouldn't give up the ghost for... Uh, in terms of their support of Hillary, but also people who wouldn't give up the ghost in terms of like a narrative they had bought into about why uh, Bernie lost in 2016. And, and frankly, I haven't had, um, you don't get the opportunity. I haven't had the opportunity to talk to people who sort of like have had a, at least a, uh, a change in perspective on how they're presenting it. So this, I, I mean, I, I see this as a pretty valuable opportunity just from a generic standpoint, like, what mm-hmm. you know to understand um how people get that immersed into it because i, I mean i'm sort of uh, mystified on some level how it gets because because i've seen your work for you know 15 years or so more maybe mm-hmm. um yep. how when when you came in uh to this about issues it ends up becoming so much about uh, personalities was there was there a moment was there a moment where you're like hey wait a second <laughs> because because it because it wasn't you know you were into this not just into the primary but as late as like almost the end of uh, of 2017 as far as i can remember. yeah yeah, yeah. It's a, yep absolutely it's you, a, you were still talking like bernie you know uh, ruined everything um mm-hmm, uh mm-hmm. what what was it was it i mean was there a moment or was it just over a period of time it was a period of time, but it was it was it was driven by one singular purpose, right? Which is the the I knew how bad the the the, the Trump presidency would be, and it's even worse than I thought it would be because you know not having a single single Republican lawmaker have a shred of decency or patriotism or integrity. Um, Maybe that was to be expected, but I think the combination of the two. So, so looking at called where it. we were headed, I called that. that. I called that early on. Yeah, yeah, uh, <laughs> yes, you, you you did, and, and and you were and you were right. And look, I knew it too. I've been fighting right, Republicans right. Uh, since two thousand. But but I think the the, the combination. The, also, to be perfectly honest, the the unwillingness of the Democratic Party leadership to fight back with the requisite intensity. Uh, for, yeah, I advocated walking out on the Kavanaugh hearings. Right. Uh, collectively walking out and it was hinted at even by democratic leaders saying you know this is a sham this is a charade and then i said okay well if it's sham and a charade and you're saying that publicly then why are you participating in it so it's not just impeachment is another big issue that i have a criticism but they're even back to merrick garland so i have a lot of criticisms of the democratic party too and disappointments but overall what started happening was i just started looking forward so here i am 2016 still you know still stinging from the 2016 fight it's 2017. Now we're looking towards 18, the, the midterms to 1920, and time is passing. I'm thinking, okay, what happens in 2020 if we're still fighting 2016, three and four years later? And I thought this is going to be a catastrophe for us. It's just, you know, as you say, talking about digital civil war, we we're going to have a mini civil war within the Democrats, leftists, progressives, etc. And I thought I have to do everything I can to prevent that from happening. So who better to do it than somebody who's a sort of hardcore pro Hillary guy who's partially critical of Bernie to come out and say, look, we can make peace. I grew up in a place where people were shooting at each other. And then eventually there was a ceasefire and a peace and they coexist. The Lebanese people coexist, people who were mortal enemies. Then they did it because eventually you can't be at war permanently. So because you live together. So so. That, that was my sense that maybe I could play a role, a constructive role. But, of course, I've gotten a lot of heat because there was skepticism initially um, on, on the Bernie side. But I have to say, Sam, it's been amazing how many people have sort of welcomed this and reached back out to. And that's been very gratifying. And there are also a lot of people who, who are my former uh, in the trenches or Hillary people who many have understood and have come with me and say, yep, we're looking toward 2020. This is great. And then some have been very, very angry at me and say you're a traitor and you're abandoning us and how can you do this and 
But you know what? Sometimes you just have to do what you have to do and not care about who's who's attacking you and do it for the for the greater good. To me, the greater good is defeating Republicans. It's just that simple. Right. Uh, and so let me ask you this. Why do you think so few people have made the adjustments on, on both sides from 2016? Mm-hmm. Or, or, or am, am I not seeing that they have? I mean, that's the thing that's, mm-hmm. I think, uh, very difficult about Twitter is that um, the, you know, I sp- I, is, is a certain myopia, right? Not just because of yeah. who I follow, but Twitter itself. I could follow everyone on Twitter and I would still have a tremendous amount of myopia as to what's going on. But um, give me your sense of to the extent of how many have d- turned toward looking towards the future and to the extent that they haven't. What do you think it is that keeps some folks locked in, regardless of which side they're on? I, I, I think that uh, people were genuinely hurt. Um, they were attacked. They were smeared. They were, they were, that their, their integrity and their principle was called into question. And, and no, nobody likes that. People get angry. And it is true that Twitter is not fully reflective. I, you know, I'm not one of those guys who says uh, Twitter is not real life. The, Twitter, of course, is real life. The reason I used to, to go back to an early point you made, I say the non-virtual world, is because people distinguish real life from Twitter, which is not the case. Twitter is part of our life, part right. of all our real lives, Facebook, all these platforms. It's just we're, we're now integrated with technology in so many ways. So I say non-virtual, maybe I should say non-digital. So, but Twitter is real life, but in some ways the political fights that happen there are not fully reflective of the wider electorate and people who are less involved. So I think, I think the answer to your question, and I've learned this uh, over this process of the past year and a half, trying to, trying to make peace and bring people together. There are some people looking at me and say, wait a minute, you know, I, got, I got sexist, misogynistic, racist attacks. There's no way I'm forgiving anybody who did that to me. And my answer always is, look, I can't speak for you. I can't ask you to erase what you experienced. And so I'm just trying to lead by example by just doing it for myself. But I sure don't want to be the guy who's telling people, you know, forget about the fact that, that, that you were attacked. I, so, so, this is, so I'm not sure I can answer your question fully, right. Sam, of, of saying, you know, why other people are doing it. I, I figure the best way to do it is just to do it myself. And if it sets an example for others, great. And if it's just my own personal coming back to where I belong, which is as a progressive activist, then I'll just do it for me. Now, is the idea that uh, we want to uh, come together to fight the right or is it is there do you have a notion that we can all come together? Because that seems to me to be right now like a uh, a big theme in this primary. And I don't want to start <laughs> Around yeah, no, I hear, I, this I, war, but but you know, right. d- there are there are some of the candidates who are out there going like, I'm a unity candidate. I'm gonna I'm gonna mm-hmm. you know uh, Biden saying stuff like this, uh, Buddha judge to a certain extent, although he's you know I think he's um, he's trying to be a little bit more nuanced. Um, uh, Beto to a certain extent was on that early on. This idea that. Um, we're going to bring people together. Maybe, maybe there's other, uh, you know, uh, 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 candidates who are, who are saying that as well. But those are the more, I guess, prominent ones. Um, I mean, how, you know, how much of your, uh, from your experience, how possible is that? I mean, or, or, or let me put it this way. I mean, obviously, you've been through an actual civil war where people came together. Mm-hmm. But that didn't right. happen until, like, People started shooting. Years at later. Him. Yeah. And, and, and there was a lot of shooting that went on in between there. Um, yep. And it's much easier to live with. I'm going to argue with people on Twitter, conservatives on Twitter and try and, you know, uh, beat them at the ballot box. Uh, than it is they're dropping uh, bombs and they're firing uh, rockets, uh, you know, right. uh, into my neighborhood. Right. I mean, so w- w- what's your sense of that? I, I, I it's, it's an excellent question, and, it, and it's a very important one, right? Because uh, I think that the idea of unity in this very vague, general, happy, touchy-feely way, or we can all come together and just forget everything that's happening, I think is, is, is just pie in the sky. I think it's unrealistic, and it doesn't take into account the reality. To me, when you, when you fight injustice, which is what I do, I'm not a political scientist, I'm not a political expert, really. I used to be a musician. I used to be a music producer for, for most of my career, and then I got into politics as an activist, as somebody who just cared. You, you can't, there is no halfway between, hey, you know, you like kidnapping babies from parents and throwing them to ice cold freezers. You, you, you like police brutality 
and and just cops getting away with with murdering the black motorists for doing nothing but just looking at them or just driving. Um, so let me meet you halfway, and then we'll have unity. That's I think that's absurd, and it's an insult to the idea of of, of justice and and fighting injustice. So now that said, I, I think it's important that we don't have blanket. Um, uh, sort of dismissals of an entire segment of a population like they're all exactly the same person. I think I think that people are different and people approach things from a different place. So what you don't want to do is is be sort of over the overly uh, sweeping in your in, in, in generalizations about people and their beliefs. But fundamentally for me, I believe the Republican Party at this point, the Republican Party leadership specifically, is pushing for for, for theocratic, autocratic, tyrannical, right-wing extremist rule at this point. They have no respect for the rule of law. They have no respect for our Constitution. They want to oppress women and criminalize pregnancy and, and women's reproductive health. They they On and on and on. They want to enrich oligarchs by stealing health care from, 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 from sick people. These these are not people that you meet halfway. These are people you defeat at the ballot box and you overturn their hideous, hideous policies. Now, of course, I have criticism of Democratic Party leaders, as I say, for not opposing it strongly enough. So when I talk about coming together, Sam, I'm not talking about let's all just, you know, this is all we'll just forget this once Trump is gone and it's all going to be better. These are long standing fights that go back to 200, 250 years and they're not going to be resolved <laughs> Because we say, hey, let's all come together and be peaceful. We have to fight for justice. and We have to institute a, a, a just society. And that takes a tremendous amount of work. It may not happen. It probably won't happen in our lifetimes. What's your assessment of what can, I mean, what, it, or, or, or rate for me the different roles that you see or values that you see um, in uh, in fighting the uh, th- this fight, I mean, when you talk about winning this election in particular, but more broadly, um, what? How much of it is, from your perspective, a messaging fight, or how much of it is from a policy fight? I mean, so you know, again, mm-hmm. we have examples in this Democratic primary of of different types of messaging. You know, um, some that are more aggressive, some that are like, I like Republicans. Uh, forgive me. Um, right. And I mean, I think I'm letting my uh, bias against a certain candidate show, but um, <laughs> be that as it may, those are different messaging. And there's also uh, tends to be somewhat aligned with that uh, aggressiveness in the messaging. How aggressive um, from a policy standpoint, like how much do mm-hmm. uh, the candidates feel uh, the Democratic Party needs to offer material benefits to people's lives, um, right? Uh, w- w- rate those different types of appeals and, and what you think uh, Democrats need to do in, in this coming election. I, I, I think that from the of course they're tied together. Um, the, the the policy and the messaging and, and 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 even more than that, the posture. You know, one of the biggest problems I've had with Democrats is the posture tends to be defensive about their positions, even though their positions are more popular, generally. If you look at environmental issues, climate, things like this, even guns, if you look at, if, if you look at guns, if you look at the actual polling, and I write about it in Digital Civil War, I talk about the polls that show support, majority support for democratic slash progressive issues. So, but somehow Democrats always behave like they're on the defensive, like they somehow have to pander to this so-called, and again, another theme in the book, this, this so-called real American, this sort of rural, white, church-going, gun-toting American who's the, the, the so-called quintessential American. If we appeal to them, we're going to start winning elections. And that's the way Democrats constantly think. They play into these right-wing narratives. So, Pushing good, smart policy is a crucial part. If you t- talk about Medicare for all, if you talk about affordable college, if you talk about $15 minimum wage, all these, the Green New Deal, these are all excellent policies. Some of them need to be worked through by experts to see the, how practical they can be, how they can be implemented. But, but putting forward good progressive policy is very important. But the, the, the corollary to that is understanding how 
the media and messaging system works in America. One of, the, one of the things that Democrats are so weak on, generally speaking, candidates and why Democrats lose. We win some elections, but overall, the country has moved further, further and further to the right. So when I look at the, the sweep of the past 20 years, whether or not Obama won, whether or not the, the midterms, you know, we've had some moments in which we've had an electoral victory. But generally speaking, we have gone backwards. Roe Ro v. Wade is, uh, uh, is about to be overturned. All our rights are going away. We have autocracy with Donald Trump as president. So I think the answer is put forth excellent progressive policy, have the courage of your convictions, but also understand how communications and media move around. There is no liberal media, and right-wing media is programming 30% of the population. People, I don't think Democrats get that, Sam. The, my biggest concern is they need to speak to that. So it's, it's a combination of all those things and more, of course, and, and just the courage of your convictions. Who do you perceive your audience? I mean, and not just a specific. I'm not just saying you, but 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 people who are situated like you on, um, you know, on social media. Like like wh- like, what is the? Um, I I'm I'm totally with you that Twitter is real life. Of course, it's real life. Everything that yep. we go through is real life. Uh, exactly. Um, and and Twitter has some very real applications in the context of. Uh, of of political fights. What do you perceive uh, it to be, and what do you perceive your role in it? Well, I, I you can look at demographic breakdowns of different audiences. I, uh, Twitter gives everybody the capacity to take a, gen- a very broad look at who who their audience is. But I I've never been a fan of segmentation. You know, I've been in in the political uh, trenches for a long time, and I've worked within. I've worked outside the system, inside the inside the system, polling and focus grouping and segmentation, and you know all these different types of ways we slice and dice the electorate. I I, I actually am a believer in, and maybe it's maybe it's naivete in some way. Maybe I, I just I'm idealistic in the sense that I think that a that a good message can reach everybody. So when I when I go on Twitter or Facebook or anywhere when I go go on media and, and talk, I, I I just try to speak in the the broadest, most general terms. I don't assume everybody's a political expert. One of the things you get in this media elite. Um, is 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 all these isms and people you know dropping terms and ideas and <laughs> philosophers and thinkers? But to me, that's just a little bit too highfalutin for me as a guy who used to be a musician who used to you know who grew up in a war. Who, uh, I just look at it as okay, we all can agree that we need clean air and water. That that one would want their child to grow up in a world where they're not drinking polluted water, right? That's something that should reach everyone. There, there shouldn't be an adult who, 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 who can't understand the notion of, okay, it's not fair that some hedge fund guy, and I'm a New Yorker, is buying a $100 million condo overlooking Central Park, not even living in it, just doing it to show off to some other billionaire, while there are kids who can't afford school supplies. Anybody with common sense can look at that and say, okay, that's just not right. It's just not fair. So uh, same with, say, the Tamir Rice case, which I talk about in the book. Here's a 12-year-old boy. When the, the, the cops were called on him because he was holding a toy gun and playing in a park, the caller to 911 said, it's probably a juvenile, it's probably a toy, two or three times. And yet the cops showed up in a drive-by shooting, just literally pulled up and shot the boy to death, left him dying in the snow for four minutes, not giving him any assistance, and then cuffed his young sister who was running to help her brother. And then there were no consequences, none whatsoever. Nobody can look at that and say, oh, that's fine. <laughs> that's, that's not a problem. That should happen in America. So, so the way I look at it is I, I'm talking to everybody and nobody, right? Whoever's listening, when I go on Twitter and say what I say, I assume any American adult um, can, can understand what I'm saying, if that makes sense. Yeah, it does. But the, I mean, the number of people who are there on Twitter who are talking about politics Presumably, if they're following you, they either really vehemently disagree with you or they generally agree with <laughs> right. you, right? Like, isn't, yeah. isn't it about uh, influencing people who have, you know, more access to the media? I mean, I, see, it, I believe in, I, well, I believe it reverberates. See, I, to, to me, I, 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 I'll, I'll do a tweet and then I'll see it show up in some, you know, get picked up by some media outlet talking about an issue and then. I feel like the information flows. If, if you, if, I often use this analogy. If you have a 30,000 foot view of, of America and you think of information as these sort of rivers of, of, of data flowing around, because we're, we're getting information from Facebook, from New York Times, from, from, from you, from, from podcasts from all over the place, 
people are exposed to information and information has a way of moving through the system. And we use the term viral, which is, was an overused term 10 years ago. And it's certainly overused now, but it's, it's, it's understandable, right? The idea of a virus. So you can say something and it can have like the whole butterfly effect where a week or two or three later can end up changing a policy. So yeah, you are talking to a very limited population, but there can be much wider effects of people speaking up. Also, one thing that's very important to me, because I'm glad you raised this, a lot of people minimize the idea of somebody going on a Facebook or Twitter or, or Reddit and, and speaking out, or having their own podcast or their radio show or blogging or whatever they do. There's nothing more important than speaking up about injustice, right? The, the, speaking out is the first step towards taking action and fixing it, and it is an action in and of itself. So anybody who minimizes, oh, you're just, you're just tweeting, what a waste of time. But I know countries where you cannot speak freely or you'll get taken away. You'll disappear. I lived in a place like that during war. You couldn't just speak freely against the government. So, so there's something powerful about being able to go out there and just say, this is unjust. Uh, it's fascinating stuff. Uh, Peter Dow, um Glad to uh, to um, see you. Um, I mean, it's a it's a, to glad to have you on and to talk about this stuff and see you. Um, uh, you know, uh, uh, focused on 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 victory, whomever that uh, that that calls for at the end. And uh, we also put a couple of links to uh, your pieces uh, in the Nation uh, about Bernie Sanders, which I, I found fascinating as well. And um, uh, the book is Digital Civil War, Confronting the Far-Right Menace. Thanks so much for your time today. I really appreciate it. Thank you, and thanks for what you do, Sam. Very much appreciated. Bye-bye. Take care. All right, folks. That was a big, uh, he had a big transition. I mean, he was, he was out there in the, uh, in the battles. Yeah. I wouldn't have seen it coming. I did not see it coming. Uh, I'll take it. Take it. Of course. Um, we need a legion of Dows. He. That sounds yeah, like guys, a, that walk sounds away. Like a book. Um, I saw it coming. It's the new well, I mean, Game he's got Thrones. a piece oh, in, like, um, uh, I guess, at his pl- site, Go Left Dems. The center is just GOP light. Um, I mean, I think he's always been uh, to the left. It's just been um, a question of where that falls. I mean, it's interesting dynamic, like, you know, how sort of narrow your perspective can be once you sort of feel hemmed in. Some people maybe just are too sensitive to be online. And he goes uh, on to, uh, in The Nation, uh, less than a month ago, or he wrote, uh, I was Bernie's biggest critic in 2016. I've changed my mind. Doesn't come out to necessarily endorse uh, Bernie, but he, I think, has backed off a lot of his criticism in terms of the implications of Bernie um, on the general election and, um, you know, broadly speaking, whether he's a net positive for uh, the Democrats as a whole. Um, hard to argue that, 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 that at this point that Bernie has not been a net positive for the Democrats, particularly when you look at, like, the... And, you know, I mean, I think there is a tendency maybe particularly on the left, but I don't know, to um, really invest in an individual versus what they represent or what has built up around them. You know, and... um, Great man theory. Yeah, I mean, but it's also like, you know, as easy as like saying that that glib thing that people say like um, Republicans, uh, uh, Democrats... um, fall in love and Republicans fall in line is basically it. And um, there is a sense of like Democrats need to love their candidates. And um, even for someone like me who thinks that elections are very important, um, I don't think that they should, should in any way um, supplant constant agitation because I also think law- lawmaking is important. Activism is important. Actually, in many respects, m- more important. But um, I certainly don't think that you need to love your candidate. No, I prefer to keep a collegial distance from my candidate, maybe like at least the length of a ruler. Yes, exactly. Arm's length is, is the best way to approach these uh, people and realize that it, it, it's more about that person 
what builds up around them and what their perspective towards what builds up around them is. And sometimes it's hard to determine. Like, you know, I, I was going back through some uh, old, um, some archives of, of mine back in, uh, during, you know, right after Obama got elected, right before he got elected. And I, I mean, for me, I was clearly making a bet and I knew I was making a bet. I thought that uh, Clinton and Obama were very similar, but there was a better likelihood in my mind that Obama was going to surprise me happily. And on top of which, there was also a massive grassroots. I mean, uh, Dow mentioned Howard Dean, and Howard Dean was sort of the first of that. The first one where online fundraising, where <clears throat> your appeal, where grassroots appeal could be sort of weaponized in a way that couldn't be weaponized before because of, of what was happening online. And, and Howard Dean was not particularly a leftist candidate in many respects he was i mean he was against the war and so he's you know people sort of um projected that position onto other positions but a lot of his politics were very very um center lefty to center e I mean, he was conservative on a lot of economic issues. I wouldn't say like conservative in the way that we're talking about with conservative uh, people identify as conservatives, but um, nevertheless, he represented a democratization of of power, which Obama did too. Obama ultimately decided, and it was quite clear very early on that he had decided to basically quash the organization that had built up around him because they didn't want to be challenged and hemmed in by it. Now, someone like Bernie and Elizabeth Warren, frankly, it seems to me dispositionally and also as a function of their politics, they not, not only would not do that. Now, they don't have neither one of them has the ability to build what Obama did or, 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 or has at this point. Uh, not only dispositionally do they not seem inclined to do that, they can't. Their politics are completely a function of that. I mean, um, and... Well, they could, but they'd be huge hypocrites. Well, no. I mean, Obama was hypocritical. Um, you can be a hypocrite. It's just that I don't think that they even think that they're, they could succeed if it was just an inside game. Obama not only thought that he could succeed if it's just an inside game, felt that we can only succeed if it's an inside game. To the point where the Obama campaign during the election said to donors, do not donate to outside groups. Even, you know, doesn't matter if they support us. Don't donate to them. We need full control. We can't have anybody going rogue. Um, some respects that's helpful they had no drama they had no scandals um from their perspective it's helpful but from the perspective of you know if obama for america had been allowed to grow joe lieberman would have had to vote a different way when it came to either like a medicare buy-in at 55 or public options. Or just straight up defect, which would have been bad, but at least would have clarified what it was about. Well, he wouldn't have at that point. Um, you think so? I mean, <clears throat> I guess with just a couple years left, not running again and only looking for future lobbying jobs, why not? I mean, I, he could have, I guess, but he, he still wanted to maintain at that point. Even just sort of his brand? Yeah. Wow. I think so. Um, but Joe Lieberman is just an example. And, and so, um, I don't know. We'll see. I'm not even sure what uh, led me down that path. But I will say this. Folks, you can become a member of this program by going to jointhemajorityreport.com. When you do, you not only support the, um, the free show, but you get extra content every day. You also get it commercial-free. 
Don't forget uh, JustCoffee.coop, fair trade coffee, tea, or chocolate. Use the coupon code MAJORITY to get 10% off. I don't consider that a commercial because they're, they're, they're a total movement ally. That's, that's like a, we're doing everybody a favor by telling them about that. Um, also, Capterra. It's the leading free online resource to help you find the best software solution for your business with over 850,000 reviews of products from real software users in more than 700 specific categories of software. It has everything you need to make an informed decision fast. Visit capterra.com slash majority for free to make an informed software decision for your business today. Everything's free on the site, folks. It's just a, it's, it's just a free resource. It's C-A-P-T-E-R-R-A dot com slash majority. Capterra software selection simplified. Michael, today is Monday. Um, weird for me to say that. Mm. It feels to, very odd. To actually here. to talk to you on a Monday. But be that as it may, tomorrow is Tuesday. Yes, indeed. And I know you'll be here Tuesday. Indeed. Why? I will be here Tuesday to help ship the majority report um, at noon. And then? And then at 7 o'clock, we will be talking about the illicit history of Bernie's anti-imperialism, the New York Times, and how it's absolutely disgusting inability to understand it, and the dangers of Elizabeth Warren's green militarism. And then Chad Vigorous of The Discourse, who's brilliant, is going to be in studio, and we're going to talk about Nate Silver, Pod Save America, nerdism, and then loop back to the difference between <laughs> politics and policy, Bernie versus Warren, and a whole bunch more. Patreon.com slash TMBS. Michael Brooks Show on YouTube. Will he be joining us in the food buckets? Uh, I'm going to try to rope him into the food buckets. I should say this at fair. 6 of p.m. That's not right. He totally. I'm just you literally gotta, asking him if he wants to. No, you got to eat it all. All three. No, no, no. no. That's not how it is. We're He'd having have a contest his own. to see who gets through the most of it. Yes, and that's then like, and then the that's winner like doing like let's see who can winner. punch the softest, and then the winner. <laughs> what? You ever play that game? No. Like, let's see who can punch the softest. No, that's you good. go first. You punch the softest, no. and then I punch you, and I go, "Oops, I lost." <laughs> that actually sounds like a pretty good game. But like this whole idea, like <laughs> who's going to get through more of the uh, bucket? Well, You're both going to lose. lose it. No, no, no. It's three of us first of all, and the winner and the loser has to buy a couple of rounds of drinks. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you, look, that is a look, ripoff. Look. If I was, uh, listen, if, in fact, I am. I'm going to sue I am you. a Patreon supporter. I'm sue you. And <laughs> as a Patreon supporter, that is not what I was, I, what I I was doing. I was doing this to watch you eat the whole bucket, not to see who, who can not eat the most. Well, we'll see how much we get through. It's, we're going to make a good effort. Wow, you're putting effort. a lot on the line. How we're many gonna drinks are you buying? We're gonna make how many drinks do you have to buy? <laughs> a couple of rounds. A couple of rounds? <laughs> <laughs> hey. So wait a second. So you made this so whole thing. So it's 6 p.m. Wait a second. Let me just be clear. We are going to eat. You made this whole thing. When we hit 2,000 patrons, we're 2, going to have the food bucket challenge. You can get through the most of the food bucket. Matt, I think we've been pretty clear that it's an amount of uh, how can get not, through the most talent. Uh, that's contest. not. Wait a second. You, you just, added hey, something you to you just the, reveal your own ignorance. Excuse me. Yeah, we have to save I'm some sorry. Of the I bucket. guess I was an yeah, ignorant yeah. when I signed up <laughs> and I thought I bought into the classic <laughs> construct of challenge, which is like Who the, can eat I, the most? Like right. The, ice the bucket, challenge. The ice bucket the challenge. The ice bucket exactly. challenge wasn't like who can uh, who can maybe Actually, that's get what we're as gonna, much ice we're on gonna, you? Yes. We're going to pour it over ourselves. We're going to pour it over ourselves. <laughs> exactly. We'll save one for your... And then we're going to have to go out and get drinks. And then we're going to have to have a drink. <laughs> we're really <laughs> so it's a bummer. We really... Yeah. Oh, wow. man. The three of us are going to have to go get drunk after. I got to get into the Discord <laughs> and show a little Discord because uh, this is... Damn, well, bless me, Father, if I have sinned. <laughs> yeah. Oh, Oh, bless. oh, sorry, you didn't read the five prints on the bucket challenge. Bless me, Father. It's just going to be dinner so it's, for Matt. At six, yeah, I was going to say, it, uh, at 6 p.m., we're, what are we calling it, Matt? What's the Korean Better thing? The what thing? What's the Korean? <laughs> oh, business bureau. mukbang. <laughs> we're going to do uh, mukbang at 6 p.m. So, yeah, I'll have a bite or two. And file a complaint. <laughs> 
Yeah, Michael should have to eat at least 25% of the bucket. Oh, 50%. <laughs> yeah, it's, no, Are you serious? It's not even in thirds. Like, I'll be surprised if he eats thirds. any of it. No, I think it should be 50% for you and then a quarter and a quarter. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. Oh no! If it was revenue sharing, it'd be much lower for them. <laughs> <I'd be laughs> <lost. laughs> uh, file a complaint. <laughs> Online <laughs> misrepresentation. <laughs> Sorry. Go ahead, Jamie. I'm just filling out a form. I go get some better business bureau. Complaint. <laughs> I would like to speak to the better business bureau because I expected my my uh 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 uh, uh co-host who rents the studio for me. I I never watched the program, but I wanted to tune in to see him get violently ill on YouTube, and and I am not getting what I paid for. God damn it! <laughs> Thank you. If you could type that up, I could just copy paste. I'll shoot that to you in the front half while I'm promoting my ventures and you're Good. taking calls. <laughs> Jamie? Oh, my God. Oh, wait. I'm sorry. Hold on. I do have to say hmm. August 24th, live show in Chicago. Tickets are available and they're going fast. I would get them today. Link on the majority.fm homepage. Oh, are they going fast just like you're going to eat a bucket full, full of food? Well, uh, un- unlike, unlike the uh, bucket full of food, we will be in Chicago on August 24th <laughs> at Lincoln Hall. Okay. For a full Jim. show. Uh, man, I don't even remember what I was going to say now. Um, this week on the Antifada, we spoke with Samuel Stein, author of Capital City, Gentrification uh, and the Real Estate State, about city planning, uh, why capitalism cannot solve the housing question, it can only move it around, and why Trump is the apotheosis of the real estate state. Um, we also recorded a bonus with Sam where we talk about our worst apartment stories. Um, he's got an especially crazy one that involves attempted murder on the part of the landlord. And uh, yeah, check it out. I'm sorry. My brain is literally still in recovery mode from taking in so many high level ideas yesterday when we talked about communization with the people from Swampside Chats. So that is a teaser for what's coming out this week. Matt. On a literary hangover, the YouTube channel got the Song of Hiawatha, the episode 21, uh, I believe it is. And uh, coming up this week, uh, it's going to be a little bit early for patrons, is M- the life of Margaret Fuller. We're talking about her and her uh, woman in the 19th century. She was sort of the best of the uh, Concord, the Massachusetts mid-century set. Uh, and uh, actually, uh, she went on Brook Farm. You guys heard of Brook Farm? Was a uh, sort of so like an early it was socialist like a utopia. Yeah, yeah, it was. It was based on the uh, uh, works of or the teachings of Charles Foyer. Uh, and uh, Margaret Fuller bought a cow there that uh, Nathaniel Hawthorne called the transcendental heifer because it kicked over the milk pail because uh, Hawthorne didn't like her very much. Th- thought she was evil. Oh my God, that is so cute. <laughs> <laughs> All right, you really. He, he, I like this. Su- like one of the side. I feel like literary hangover is remind everybody that Orwell was an actual socialist and make exceedingly clear that Hawthorne was a jerk. It's like a major theme of this show. Yeah. That is a valuable project. Actually, we're going to be doing Hawthorne's The Blythedale Romance on Brook, which is sort of a satire of Brook Farm next. Actually sounds funny. All right. We'll be uh, right back. 646-257-3920. Fun half. Left is best. Jamie and I may have a disagreement. Yeah, you can't just say whatever you want about people just because you're rich. I have an absolute right to mock them on YouTube. He's up there buggy whipping like he's the boss. I am not your employer. You know, I'm tired of the negativity. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to upset you. You're nervous, you're a little bit uh, upset, you're riled up. Yeah, maybe you should rethink your defense of that, you fucking idiots. We're just going to get rid of you. All right. But dude. 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 Uh, you want to smoke this joint? Yes. <laughs> Do you feel like you are a dinosaur? <laughs> Some good shit. Exactly. I'm happy now. It's a win-win. It's a win-win-win. Oh, hell yeah. Now listen to me. Two, three, four, five times. Eight, four, seven, nine, oh, six, five, oh, one, four, five, seven, two, thirty-eight, fifty-six, twenty-seven, one half, five, eight, three point nine billion. Wow. He's the ultimate math nerd. Don't you see? Why don't you get a real job instead of spewing vitriol and hatred, you left-wing limbaugh? Everybody's taking their dumb juice today. Come on, Sammy. Dance, dance, dance. Ooh. Grandpa. I had my first post 
coital scene with uh, a woman. I'm hoping to add more moves to my repertoire. All I have is the dip and the swirl. Fine, we can double dip. Yes, this is a perfect moment. No. Wait, what? You make under a million dollars a year. You're scum. You're not paying. Excuse me? Fuck you, you fucking liberal elite. I think you belong in jail. Thank you for saying that, Sam. You're a horrible, despicable person. All right, gonna take a quick break. I want to take a moment to talk to some of the libertarians out there. Take whatever vehicle you want to drive to the library. What you're talking about is jibber jab. Classic. I'm feeling more chill already. Good. Donald Trump can kiss all of our asses. Hey, Sam. Hey, Andy. Are you guys ready to uh, do some evil? Hitler was such an idiot. You think I might be a Nazi? Agree. No. Death to America. You. Yes. Wow. Wow, that's weird. No way! Unbelievable. This guy's got a really good hook. Throw our hands up. <laughs> Ooh. But Sam, I gotta get off. No worries. Let's, let's, I want to just flesh this out a little bit. I mean, look, it's a free speech issue. If you don't like me... Hey, 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 shut up! Thank you for calling into the Majority Report. Sam will be with you shortly. <laughs> I, I'm literally... Like, every time we play that, I am just... Always completely blown away by I mean I, I almost don't want to know the answer to this but like I'm wondering like did he contemplate the visual first or the story first or did just went along with the audio and then built the video to the audio I don't know it's like gravity's rainbow man it, it rewards repeated readings definitely without a doubt Calling from a 203 area code. Who's this? Where are you calling from? You are the first caller hey. of the week. Hey, this is, uh, oh, first caller of the week. Awesome. I can slowly feel the air rushing out of my lungs. Thanks for picking up. Uh, this is Tyler from New Haven. Tyler um, from New Haven. The progressive voice did, yes? Yep. Hello? Hello. Um, but can you hear me? Yep. You still with me, Sam? Yes, Tyler, go ahead. Um, the Progressive Voice did a video <laughs> not too long ago, kind of um, like covering a sort of recent back and forth between Joe Rogan and uh, Alex Jones. I'm surprised I didn't hear anything about it from like anyone else other than him. So I'm sure you guys could find that video pretty quickly. But basically, uh, he exposes Joe Rogan for saying some pretty racist stuff. Um, oh, I think so we like, did do a video Joe, on it. I think we did do a video on it when it happened oh, yeah. a while back. Is it, which, did you know if when you guys clipped it? I didn't see that. Um, I, I, whenever around when it happened, I would just, uh, Google. Maybe it was three months ago. I, maybe the, yeah. maybe it's Elks Jones. Well, what, was your, what was your guys, what was your guys take on that? I mean, um, I don't remember specifically. I don't even remember specifically what it is, but. I mean, um, I just remember that yeah. Sam thought it was funny. I, can I, can, I, I, can, I, can I go through it really quick? So basically, like, Joe Rogan made some, like, really bromantic light criticism of uh, Alex Jones, um, like, not too long ago. And Alex Jones had a hissy fit. And he right. then, like, uh, yeah. Put, put out a video where uh, Rogan has said some racist stuff. Yeah. I yeah. didn't see that. Okay. I mean, well, I don't. I, I, then. Yeah. No. I mean, I think. Uh, I mean, look. Um, there is in Boston, um, in Massachusetts, broadly speaking, healthy dose a dose of 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 racist attitude. No. And I think that. <clears throat> well, I mean, there is everywhere. But I mean, I'm just familiar with it in Massachusetts. I mean, it's there's a. It seems to me to be like a, a special brand. But maybe that's just because I I know it. I, I remember imagine. from that clip, just to help him out, I don't remember the name of it, but I remember Sam saying, like, this is back when Joe Rogan was really funny. This is when he had a lot of talent as a no. comedian. I mean, I think it was a lot of soft. Jim. Sort, it was a lot of sort of Sam remembering that Rogan used to be more on the comedy I will say, side. I will say, like, softball. Look, 
Look, I will edge. say that um, I think Rogan more than others, like for instance, uh, Nick DiPaolo. Like, I mean, these guys are yeah. similarly situated guys from Boston for the more or, le- more or less outside of Boston who I think um, yeah. uh, both had um, fairly classic um, uh, Boston-y, massachusetts type of racism. Um, yeah, I mean, and, it's just like that in sort of New England, isolated white I, community kind of thing. I yeah, mean, and I think it's, it, it, it is, um, a lot of it is um, not necessarily, you know, well thought out type of racism, which you usually hear, you know, we hear articulated in the context of like, uh, of some of the people that we generally racist follow. Racist jokes. Right. I mean, and, yeah. and I think of, of that genre, Joe Rogan's probably done more to try and, uh, enlighten himself on some level and probably has, I, you know, and for uh, what but, it's worth, that but joke with that was, said, it only goes so far. And I also, don't remember exactly. It all wasn't. I don't remember. I mean, what look, it was. It, I don't remember specifically, but it was definitely. It was. It was, it, was, it, was, it was a Planet of the Apes joke at a movie theater in an inner city. Oh yeah, that was bad. Yeah, it was stupid. It was bad, but it was. I mean, but it was not um, like something you wouldn't. You know what's really interesting to me is that basically Alex Jones had like made a video about it because he was mad at Joe Rogan or whatever for some like baby criticism. Right. And well, then I mean, Joe we're not Rogan talking... like had him back on and it was like one of the most cringy like cuckings I've ever well, seen Tyler, in my life. Well, Tyler, I mean, look, let's also you just should be watch clear more what we're talking voice, about. What, what, what we're looking at here is it's, it's business. These people are doing business. There's no ideological, you know, arguments here. It's business. And they're attacking each other, you know, and particularly, uh, you know, uh, they're attacking each other and they don't care about any of it other than to the extent that it's positions themselves and it's business. That's the, that's the, that's really the only relevant part of any of it. Yeah. Shout out to progressive voice. He actually like talks about people like that who are just so totally, uh, in the sort of, uh, like the, uh, the, um, Oh, is he laughing at me? Well, I think it just sort of feels like you might be not totally getting the point. Um, hey, I love you, oh, man. I'm just, not getting the point. Just get well, a little, just a little, little bit. Touch like, my like it's, like it's all just yes. It's all a little bit narrow. Like, I, listen, I engage in YouTube culture. Yeah. Sometimes it's fun, but to the extent it's really at the end of the day, it really is just because that's where the kids are. <laughs> I mean, literally. Um, I did a response it, video well, to the stoned progressive response video to the drunk hedonist response like, video like to like the our post-constitutional with, with order. With Pac-Man with the, with the backdrop. I mean, that's just sort of almost like a parody of that. But I, I appreciate the call. I will Tyler. say it kind of puts the light of the idea that Joe Rogan is just providing a neutral platform for ideas when he has on, I don't, n- n- maybe not alt-right, but certainly alt-light people on his show and the fact that he has previously felt it's okay to make racist jokes uh, makes me think he's there, there's something more behind it. This was a time in Rogan's career <laughs> where he was doing a lot of misdirection comedy. Like at the yeah, very an least, incredible breakdown of how funny Rogan. At the very least, jokes. he's not very finely attuned to racist attitudes. Yes, I think that's totally uh, true. And I also think that look, if you have a platform that's that big. You got to take responsibility when you put uh, anybody on there, Alex Jones, for example, and you don't do everything you can to discredit him in the eyes of your audience. You got to own some of what he does because you're telling your audience, go watch him and watch him with this perspective. I mean, that that's the thing is that like, uh, you know, some people don't understand, and I, I don't spend a lot of time articulating it, but, you know, like what I think I'm doing here. And, you know, I've had people who are, uh, I'm friendly with in, in real life who are surprised, like, I can't believe what you did to Michael Tracy. And, I, you know, I'm not, do I do journalism? Yes. I interview people. But I don't consider myself a journalist. That's not what I'm, I'm here for. 
I'm here to espouse a certain uh, ideology and I'm here as to, um, to amplify people's voices who I think should be amplified and to drown out people's voices and discredit them that I think they should be discredited. And people can do the same to me and, uh, and, and uh, audience can determine whether I am a valid source of, because it's basically people outsource stuff all the time. You know, I mean, even when I'm, you know, uh, I want to buy a saw, I outsource it. I don't, I don't, you know, learn about uh, RPMs on uh, what makes for the best. I just, I, I, I go to um, a, I don't know, I go to a website. But and, you should watch Progressive Voices. No, but, but I mean, but yeah, I mean, like, but that's the point is that there's that's some people the good who outsource think, for YouTube. Yeah. Drama. No yeah. bullshit. And there's and, really no such thing as a neutral platform in this day and age. No, and of I course think not. It's dangerous when Joe Rogan presents himself as such. Well, that that's why, you know, that's most of the stuff I attack Dave Rubin about is not like who he has on a show in an, in a vacuum because, you know, you can find worse guests on like, you know, um, I don't know, whatever, uh, some uh, Stormfront well, I mean, uh, podcast pa or whatever it is. But <laughs> Pac-Man uh, talks to guys like uh, Richard Spencer, for instance, but he's critical of them. Yes, and how you treat them when they, they come on is an indication of what you want your audience to know about them. And so when Michael Tracy came on, based upon telling me that I've deceived my audience, and he's out there you know, spewing all sorts of BS... And I didn't know that he was going to then tweet out like people calling the Charlottesville people Nazis is why, you know, what Trump won or what is it? Why Nazis oh, exist why? or or why Biden's leading? I mean, some insane crap like this. I want people to know he's a lunatic yeah. and he's a charlatan. And um, if that, you know, if my voice raised too much when I called him a coward, then I probably should have just said, you're a coward, instead of yelling, you're a coward. No, Forgive you probably, me, you father. You probably just should have leaned Forgive in. Me, but, huh? You probably but, should have just leaned in really close to him, like, dude, that's crazy. Yeah, Forgive but someone, me, Hashem. Yeah, but someone, someone, someone said to me that I'm like, I'm like Bill O'Reilly. And I'm like, well, no, that's, that's not what made Bill O'Reilly. That he yelled that one guest is not the essence of Bill O'Reilly. Yeah, more like Bill O'Cuckley. It's that it's content he did so in the service of bigotry and uh, deprivation for large swaths of people, not to mention, you know, things like pushing war and uh, specific wars. Like, that to me. Calling an abortion doctor a murderer on a nightly basis who ended up getting assassinated. Jeez, who ended sorry. up getting assassinated. It's like when people try to equate Bernie to Trump because they've both been rude to journalists. Well, what it is is yeah. people uh, mistaking content and form. Yes. And, and I will tell you right now, the one asset I have, it seems to me, if I have any asset in doing this, is that I do not uh, worry about form. <laughs> that has always been my strength. This is beanbag. Yes. All right. But here is a guy who I think is a, a very good uh, journalist. And um, we're going to we, we have a sort of a, a compare and contrast type of situation here. Um, first clip we're going to do is, um, well, here is a guy who I think is a, um, a legit journalist going on and basically um, uh, making someone who is going to put themselves out. I understand that this uh, woman is um, Vanessa Newman is just a is she now an official uh, Juan Guaido uh, representative? So, so the she's clip says this, but uh, but she presented her YouTube video or whatever it was, her New York Times thing. It's just an op-ed. A different this woman. A, oh, it's a different I know woman. it's oh, hard it? to keep all the gusanos straight, but this is a different person. That's a Houseman Houseman Newman. Newman. Oh, okay. Yeah. Sorry. Oh, I had no idea. All right. Well, then fine. Uh, even better, because here is Juan Guaido's uh, representative in the UK. And I don't know if this is a, I mean, is she like an ambassador to the shadow, the, the would-be government? Or I'm not exactly sure even what that means. But it's pretty stunning um, insofar as she seems to have the same depth 
of knowledge of the situation as that woman Hausman, who was ostensibly a comedian in her, um, her dad, I guess, uh, worked with Guaido or something to that effect. Economic advisor. Economic advisor. I just don't understand. At one point, I don't understand. At one point, are people just going to realize like, oh, I don't want to go on television with Maddie Hassan because I, I'm spewing too much BS? Or do people have not gotten the message yet? Like, I don't understand how somebody even goes on at this point uh, with Mehdi Hassan without having, like, done any of their homework. Yeah, listen to the way she laughs. It's as if she thinks he's joking. No, th- I'll, I got news for you. That is not a legit laugh. That is a, I'm super nervous here, and my media training told me if you laugh, it's going to make it seem like you're not nervous. How can you believe that a U.S. military intervention will bring democracy or freedom or human rights to Venezuela, especially with people like Elliot Abrams and John Bolton leading the charge, especially given the abysmal history of U.S. interventions in your part of the world, Guatemala, Chile, Argentina, Nicaragua, Honduras, El Salvador. Why on earth would you trust the U.S. military, let alone Donald Trump? (laughs) Oh, well, um... First of all, times have changed, and I think even uh, even uh, you know, anybody who has been involved in Latin America since the 1970s, I think a the continent has changed. B, uh, you know, the attitude of the United States. Hold to on, the one second. I just, I think she means maybe late 70s, because I seem to remember something in 1973 that just sticks out. Um, Allende sort You've of heard- strikes strikes me as like just a little bit. I mean, maybe you know, by by. But within three or four or five years after that, you know, and I love how. You and then, of course, the 80s also happened. Well, which right. is after, after the, the 70s, 70s. And there was a lot of activity. I in mean, the but, 80s. but if you skip through most of the 80s and you get to like the 90s. Well, then actually, but then you would get to 2009 when the Obama administration backed the coup in Honduras and even you could count, and I would understand why she wouldn't, maybe even 2002 in Venezuela. I was just going to say in Venezuela in yeah. 2002. But from like the, through the 90s, like there was a small, there was like eight years, I think, where there was no active U.S. intervention. No, that is they on were, the books. Well, you know, there Although was. Although I guess we. We were sending back uh, MS-13. Was yeah, that we were deporting okay. people back. We were also undermining, uh, you know, sovereign governments' policies. And also, don't even forget, you know, we're the major oh, well, stakeholders of the World Bank and IMF. Haiti. Okay, all right, and that was okay. I understand we're getting I'm too getting detailed. Let's, uh, that was actually my first point since the seventies. My first point, though, real quick, was that what I love is that the expectation set goes down. So when you go just to the seventies, you are everybody's like, come on. You got to know about the CIA coup against Allende in Chile right. because everybody knows that. But that's already it was discounting like, OK, I guess you're not going to know about the Argentinian or the Brazilian junta or the ma- or the continent wide death squad. Maybe you never heard of Iran. It, Contra. Yeah. The well, that Contra was this, that part. was in the 80s. Right. I'm no, just saying, saying 70s. Right. I mean, it's like, but it's like, I love how it's just like, fine. Let's go without saying that a Juan Guaido representative who wants regime change right now, of course, she doesn't know any of that stuff. Well, but what about just a <laughs> top line Wikipedia page entry? Like you could have seen it in an Oliver Stone movie, the Chile coup that we backed, pretty big one. I mean, people sang about it. Go ahead. And I think even, uh, even uh, you know, anybody who has been involved in Latin America since the 1970s, I think A, the continent has changed. B, uh, you know, the attitude of the United States to the region has changed. C, the understanding of counterinsurgency or counterterrorist or uh, operations or things to secure, uh, you know, safeguard a, a vulnerable population. Uh, all of those parameters and all of those understandings and methodologies have changed. You say times have changed, attitudes have changed, and yet the person leading the U.S. position on Venezuela is Elliot Abrams, a man who was deeply involved in war crimes and human rights abuses in Central America during the 80s. You have John Bolton, uh, who said recently, the Monroe Doctrine is alive and well. It's our hemisphere, he said in reference uh, to Latin America. And of course, you have Donald Trump saying Venezuela has all that oil and they're right on our back door doesn't seem to have changed at all. They seem to be interested in oil and sending people with a very bad record on human rights to help you. <laughs> hey, I was too young to live, to live through the uh, incident 
That, yeah, they, well, I, I'm younger than Elliot. you, but we've all read history. Yeah. Elliot Abrams was responsible for massive war crimes in El Salvador and elsewhere in the 1980s. He's now the man you trust to bring democracy to Venezuela. Seriously? Pause it for one second. How old is she? 17? How old is she? She was born in 1972. Okay. She was so born she in, was 19- in college oh, uh, in uh, the late 80s. Like, that's all anybody was talking about in the 80s. But maybe she just wasn't studying. Uh, she didn't get into government until she became the representative for Guaido. Here there was go. some stuff in the 80s about my dad I just potentially love, losing money. I love this because, whole theory of like, well, <laughs> I'm too young, so history doesn't exist. There was a there was a, there was a classic moment. I got to give Bagala this where Meghan McCain was on Bill Maher yes. and she's like saying Obama needs to stop blaming the Republicans for everything. And this is like six months after he got elected yeah. and they're already calling him a Nazi. And he's like, we need to reach out. You know, so it's ludicrous to begin with. And Paul Begala is like, not nearly enough. Reagan blamed Carter through like 1985. And Meghan McCain's like, well, I wasn't around then, so uh, I guess I wouldn't know or something. And then Jane Begala is like, well, I wasn't alive during the French Revolution, but I know about it. It's, and she just was like, oh, I guess I'm a blonde. It's <laughs> Oh, my God. It's amazing how, though, that that is used as not just a defense, but almost like some type of former like bragging. Like, <laughs> I'm, I'm too young. to. I wasn't living contemporaneous to that. It's like a, yeah, grandpa. the safe zone when you're playing tag. You're like, oh, I'm, I'm on here. This I mean, is- no, I'm touching wood. I wasn't alive when but the U.S. was. But the yeah. Yeah. I was five years old when we were in. throwing I'm, people out of helicopters. I'm quite convinced that there was a time not too long ago to say something like that would be considered a total liability. Like that would be something that you would say and then immediately regret saying it as opposed to thinking it was some type of defense. Go ahead, let's, let's continue. Well, I'm younger than you, but we've all read history. Elliot Abrams was responsible for massive war crimes in El Salvador and elsewhere in the 1980s. He's now the man you trust to bring democracy to Venezuela. Seriously? We just need to have the humanitarian aid enter. And we need need to get foreign terrorist organizations out from terrorizing our own people. Yes, there it is. Uh, Don't read history, but I sure know talking (laughs) points. Well, there is not a good response to that is the thing. Well, I mean, there could be, but it would involve like probably at least 45 minutes of reading and there's prep. better there is a good response in terms of substance uh, but I, there's definitely I'm, you could so I she mean, does not know uh, i do i i think no. that person is completely ignorant about all of it and it is i'll tell you something um i don't know enough about venezuelan politics to make any assessment of guaido other than to say like it seems fairly clear that he does not have popular support and that um, uh, and that what he's engaging in is an attempted coup. But if that's the person that you choose to be your representative to one of the key governments that you need to support your endeavors, like I would be a worried that they um, have no uh, capacity to govern, period. No, he's it's really a little bad. I mean, Wait, are, it's, it's him and he's got like literally... That's just incompetent. Well, but look at... I mean, yes, but it's all like the oligarchic children of, you know, the former ruling class. Literally, her are, father owned an island. Um, yes, uh, exactly. I met, this is her professional career. Newman received a BA, MA, Master of Philosophy, and then a PhD from Columbia University for her dissertation, Autonomy and Legitimacy of States, A Critical Approach to Foreign Intervention. I think she probably she knows, knows about this stuff. She knows. She's grinning like the cat that she, ate the canary. She's just laughing at him like, <laughs> nerd. I just, how she's trying to poorly, do that. like, like, uh, well, also, I don't take these. I don't take wing. They know that they are named after her or something like that. I don't take because they know that they have support from the U.S. government, no matter how incompetent they are. Well, she still would want her appearance to go better, but I think she's just going with. That's like you're old. That happened a long time ago. Wow. I'm interested in now. Also, she dated Mick Jagger in '98. Oh, I believe that. Boom. All right. That may I? May that. I do a little bit of? Uh, <laughs> and can I just say, like, I mean. I'm playing a little bit of ethnic politics here, but it's interesting to me that how many of these people have German last names. Bit strange. 
There was a certain group of people that found refuge <laughs> we need in democracy. Latin America after a certain These significant historical We need democracy in Venezuela. Yeah, she's like, oh, I, we need democracy in Venezuela. Oh, my father's fortune was built off of secret Deutsche Bank accounts in the 1940s. I don't read history. I wasn't alive. I wasn't alive. Matty, you are such a nerd. <laughs> yeah. These are literally the people from the Jake Flores Means TV video. Mm. Yes. Like, mm. Mm. <laughs> What ha- tell me again what happened in the 80s mm, glasses it would be weird like i i devoid history too if like there's like weird family stuff that might come up and- hey look 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 betty off the record everybody knows these stories frankly it's I old and it's did boring my thesis and- on autonomy of countries in the moment Venezuela. I didn't get tied up with the history stuff. Bottom line is dad's ready to get back home and restart slavery mine. All right. Um, oh, okay. So, so Mehdi Hassan was the example of <laughs> the journalist who was uh, doing quality work. Let's go over to Fox and Friends. And this is, look, this is going to be the most meaningless uh, piece of video that we show you today. But um, it is just too funny to watch the Fox and Friends try and get out there and do a nanny state um, piece. This is where, you know, of course, somebody wants to um, uh, tell you not to text when you're crossing the street because you could get hit by a car or run into somebody. Now, this is a huge problem, particularly in New York City. I imagine it's a problem in other cities, but it's a huge problem here. Like one, I mean, just walking, but like people running into bikes, um, people getting hit by cars. I mean, this is a huge problem. And like literally if I had a, if there was like an RFID chip or something I could implant in my daughter's hands so that when she was to step off a curb, it would like make her fingers freeze. I would do it. Um, it's another de Blasio here is failure. Steve Ducey trying to do a segment on the nanny state. And it turns out he's, uh, oh, I mean, I can't believe it. This is not one of those things that they, he might they're going to do that, again live. Yeah, Let's he, put it that way. He might be discovering that there is a problem with people not paying attention to anything R- besides their yeah, phones. Yeah, exactly. Here we go. We've been watching all sorts of people walking by with their texting device. Excuse me, ma'am. Hello. Hello. Excuse me. <laughs> Hi. Can I ask a question? Um, no. it'll, it'll just take a second. Okay. I see you're walking through the crosswalk with your phone. Yeah. How often do you look at your phone uh, with a text and things like that? Um, I try not to. Often. You may be going forward. You could get fined two hundred fifty dollars. Is that a bad idea or a I, good idea? I really don't want it. Okay. I don't <laughs> think she has. She's in a hurry to go to work. Okay. okay. This guy right over here. Hi. How are you? Look at this guy right here. See, he's using his uh, phone through. Hi, excuse me. Can I ask a question? Can you tell that New York City is a very busy place? It is indeed. All right. Uh, meanwhile, we got all these people. They're going to work. Keep in mind, if you're working in New York City at uh, 9 o'clock, you got uh, 20 minutes to go. Right. And so everybody's in a big hurry. Now, right uh, here, AJ, Note to producer, don't I'm do these segments at this time. Here we go. See if I can get his attention. Excuse me. Excuse me, sir. Hi. Excuse me? <laughs> Can I ask you a question? <laughs> Come on. Let's go across the street. Oh, I'm going to get hit by a car. Oh. Now, all the people who are texting or looking at their phones could be subject to a $250 fine going forward. Yeah. yeah but it looks right. as if, so far, from the people on the streets of New York City, let's just talk to this guy. Hi. Excuse me. Can I ask you a question? <laughs> Everybody. <laughs> What's the fine for harassing commuters? Oh, my God. No kidding. Again, no one wants to talk to Ducey. <laughs> no one. I love it. Ducey on the Lucy. I that think is, they he's it. getting treated. And by the way, you shouldn't be mean to people trying to raise money for Amnesty International on the street. It's a nightmare, nightmare job. Be nice to them and move by them quickly. But they are giving him the you're trying to raise money for amnesty international on the street treatment honestly not, there isn't even like a oh it's tv none of the it's just like nope yeah nope, i mean nope. if you see uh someone like uh, steve ducey to come up to you it, it's perfectly um uh, okay to go like no 
Stop. Oh, okay. yes. If it's Ducey, do that. Stand back. You gotta go, you're aptly That's, named. Have a good day. I mean, the, the beauty of them trying to build this sort of nanny state segment around it, like where people, these people are really pissed at the idea that someone would tell them what to do. Oh, I'm sorry. Could you stop for one second? I need to. They interrupt also, your day. They can't decide because they've also done segments on how sad it is that everyone is always on their phones. Right. Well, it's, it's teens, okay when they do teens, it. and they'll do they'll do a forty five minute segment uh, a while back on uh, uh, teenagers who wear their pants too low. But the idea that you would actually impose uh, some type of um, uh, restriction on texting as you're walking through a street. Uh, is is highly problematic to them, um, and incidentally, you know we look at things like um, Vision Zero in this city, which was much maligned. But I can tell you right now, from my perspective, that people people drive slower. They drive slower in New York City than they did three years ago. And um, why was it maligned? I mean, I, I'm not a de Blasio fan, but I don't understand. Oh, it was problem. much maligned. What, what, what was it again? Just because it was. You're going to make us drive a... 25 miles right. an hour. It's crazy. Just it's that. so hostile to cars. Right. That's a good thing. It's you a should good be thing. hostile to cars. Cars but, are bad. But, you, cars are but you know, this is the way this trajectory. All, I mean, I don't know if you guys are too young to remember, like, the huge, huge national issue. Not smoking in restaurants was even bigger, but buckling your seatbelt. That's when those disgusting. laws got passed, Morton Downey Jr., who was the original um, like Rush Limbaugh character, he would do episode, show after show on the just the infringement, the nanny state, making you buckle your seatbelts. My grandma uh, was affected by that. She had bad dreams about like that she'd be in a car crash and wouldn't be able to get out because the seatbelts. Right, uh, that's what they were Because well, what happens is, is you get trapped by the seatbelt and then you can't get out. And it's right. a very bad thing. But because there's a lot of people, they, they might feel a little <laughs> scared. They were crashed, but then they can step outside. But then when you can't, then you die. And remember, I mean, the cigarettes smoking, nobody, I mean, you don't hear anybody complain about that now. It's, I mean, it's like, it's, um, it's, uh, it's absurd when you go into a place uh, only in, in Vegas is the only place to see people smoke inside. Sean got very excited when we were in Miami and you could smoke in a bar. Oh, well, there you go. And, um, and the, remember the 20, the 30 ounce slushies that became outlawed or whatever it was. Oh, I was against that. Um, soda yeah, the soda ban. I'd like to see the, actually the, the data now to see if that's had an impact, a positive impact or a negative one in some economic standpoint. I Somebody remember, must have done some some research now. Is that why sodas are 20 ounces here and not 24? Because I remember them being I 24 so. in North Dakota. I think so. Mm, soda sommelier. Uh, let's go to the phones. Calling from a 610 area code. Who's this? Where are you calling from? Hello, Sam. Can you hear me? Yes. Who's this? Where are you calling from? Hi, Sam. This is Steve from Audubon, PA. Steve from uh, Pennsylvania. What's on your mind? Uh, yeah, I just wanted to say that I really appreciated you having Peter Dow on the show. I think that was one of those good things that happened now of 2016 was seeing that a person that prominent could actually change their position. And uh, that actually gives me some hope. So I thought that was a really good conversation. Oh, well, thank you. I appreciate it. Um, yeah, I thought it was pretty good, too. Um, I just wanted to bring up real quick um, uh, Chelsea Manning. Um, I don't know if I, uh, I haven't been able to watch her last week or so. I didn't know if you realized that they had put her back into jail. Yeah. We mentioned that, um, I think it was a Friday. Yeah. Friday. She was, uh, put back into jail. The, uh, the first grand jury that she refused to testify, uh, in front of, uh, disbanded. They reconstituted a second grand jury. She has been put in jail. And now there was also the last I heard as of Friday was that the judge was implying or, or, or um, contemplating fining her $500 a day in addition to the imprisonment. Yeah. Now, this is unprecedented. As far as I know, it's unprecedented to uh, find someone in this way 
I guess maybe, you know, uh, in, in certain contempt cases, people get fines. But I hadn't heard about this in terms of the context of a grand jury. I don't know what the latest well, is on like, that. Uh, yeah, that was about where I am with it. Um, there is a fundraiser for her. Um, the other thing she did was she had a, 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 a Twitch stream that went on uh, where she she was online uh, gaming with some people. Do you think that this constitutes like she would have a case for cruel and unusual punishment? I mean, it seems like to me that, that, that she would have had it in the context of uh, the solitary confinement in her first imprisonment, okay. frankly. But the um, uh, Supreme Court, I think, has ruled that that is not unconstitutional. That does not cross that threshold. I, 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 I would, I mean, I think, you know, uh, to the extent that I've read... Yeah, I mean, to, 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 the, to the extent that I've read... Um, you know, what psychiatrists say, they say it's uh, that, that it's torturous. Um, but I mean, she has fewer rights than someone who's actually been accused of a crime in this scenario. Yeah. I mean, I look, I think that there is um, there is, uh, the the mechanism for uh, punishing people who refuse to testify in front of a grand jury. Um, I think there is. Well, it's not supposed to be punitive. I Yes, and I think the fines are clearly uh, supposed to be are, are punitive in that instance. But I think the idea is too is that you're supposed to compel testimony, and I think there are certain circumstances where it's just like you 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 need to use discretion and say this is not someone that we're going to do this to. This person has already in uh, associated with this stuff that's being investigated, already served far more time than she should have. And so, um, I, I mean, I think it's uh, horrific to send her back to prison. It's just unbelievable. Yeah. Um, can I just say one quick thing? I really appreciate you taking my call. Um, I know you're up against time. Uh, I just wanted to point out um, how, how egregious it is to compare a person who, when given an opportunity to have some form of power to uh, speak out and, and, and stand up against war crimes, against criminal activity um, in the higher levels of our government, or, you know, normally we're from the outside looking in at that stuff. Um, that person has their life completely destroyed. And then you have Trump, who's now about to pardon a second war criminal. Yeah. Um, it, yeah. It's just completely disgusting. Um, I, I just uh, thank you for taking my call, and I, I always want to. Couldn't agree um, more, Steve. Boost. Appreciate the call. Thank you. Couldn't agree more with that. Thank Free you, all. Chelsea Manning. Um, <clears throat> hey, folks, look, I um, I am reluctant to uh, promote violence of any type which is why it gives me such great pleasure to promote this video of um, Kargan of Sargon. Oh, but don't we have one of Sargon? Well, we can. Uh, we don't have oh, uh, okay. Sargon actually getting hit with the okay. nunchuck. We well, have we have two. Off. We have one image and one uh, video clip. Uh, one is of Nigel Farage getting milkshaked, and one is a picture of... Sargon of Arkad getting milkshaked. And here's the thing. Well, here's the picture of uh, Sargon of Arkad wearing the Arcadian milkshake um, <laughs> covering, the traditional uh, milkshakian uh, uh, covering. He's been anointed. Um, he's been anointed. Um, he is, uh, he's wearing that milkshake with pride. Somebody got him, it appears, from behind. Because uh, you can see the milkshake pattern sort of on like the back a, of his head and yeah. it makes him look a little more distinguished in some respects i think it's it actually i i when i see him i usually think carl of swindon he, when i think of this i do in some ways i see a sort of a cod emerging from the battlefield of ideas yes indeed now here is a video of nigel farage getting a milkshake and uh let me address both of the milkshakians uh at the same time Oh, there you go. Take him away. Take him away. 
Boom! Nice! Nice underhanded motion yeah. there. Very good. Take him away. Take him away. Send him no more Fisher fillets for him. No more... Complete failure. Complete failure. Oh, did you hear him say that? Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. You must... You must... No, <laughs> People, him are, laughing at, people are laughing at him. Laugh now, sounds look, like me. Here's the deal. On this show. This is why I think this is so appropriate. This is why I think it's so, such an appropriate form of protest. Now, some people say, oh, it's not appropriate. I think this is, there couldn't be anything more appropriate than this. And I'll tell you why. I had, uh, I've been milkshaked multiple times over the course of doing this show by my kids. Nobody reports on it. I, I've, I've had uh, clothes ruined just like this. Take them I'm away. Milkshake. I've been ice creamed. Uh, I've been uh, I've been pizzaed. I don't know if anybody's ever been pizzaed before, where they, where uh, your child will take a slice of pizza and just accidentally drop it on your lap or on your chest. Nobody reported on it because these things happen. It's not that big of a deal. The reason why these are reported on and why there's stories about these is because it is a political act. It is symbolic. No, no people were harmed. These milkshakes are not sent in it. And the people on the receiving end of them, the, the only problem is it just didn't go in their mouth. It ended up going on their clothes. Milkshakes are delightful. Everybody loves them. Uh, most people like them to drink them as opposed to wear them. But the point is, it is a, it's a political act. It is meant to make them like a pie in the face. It's meant to make them humiliated and look silly. And I think this is incredibly effective. The people laughing at them. And it's also meant to make them like uh, aware that like you can't, you're accountable in some fashion. This is just a milkshake, but you're accountable. And um, I, 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 I couldn't be more happy. Even if somebody was to come up and milkshake me, guess what uh, papers would report on it? None. Yes. We, exactly. we would make a video ourselves. We, no, we would a, make a video. A fascist uh, milkshake Sam Cedar. Yeah. I mean, I would do a selfie and I would make a video of it, but these stories are reported in newspapers and they should be. And that, and that shows the effectiveness of it. This is the content and form thing again. Like somebody was, somebody in the UK was saying, well, what if one of your favorite politicians got milkshake? And it's like, if Corbyn got milkshake, he'd generally get sympathy. <laughs> right. I mean, if Corbyn Google, got milkshake vegan? and you were like the, the, the story would be, well, I don't know what the story would be, but I can guess it would it would help be helpful to him. The far right doesn't do milkshakes, though. They usually just do violence. Right. But I, it would be um, it would be it would be nice to see those guys in Charlottesville to go out and actually just like here are milkshakes. Here are milkshakes. We're gonna milkshake well, thank you, you, Jews. Jews should drink milkshakes. Don't mind if I do. Oh, we got to play this clip. Uh, speaking of which, um, I don't know why this occurs to me, but uh, there's a video, there's a movie coming out about the about censor censorship. And no, uh, it's not about um, uh, political prisoners in China. Uh, it's no, no, it's not about um, uh, political prisoners, you know, maybe from uh, like, you know, Bolsonaro or something like that. It's not about, um, you know, protesters in this country who've been, you know, kettled and, and uh, or people who are uh, arrested before like a, a political convention taken off the streets. No, it's about Alex Jones and Laura Loomer and um, Gavin McGinnis and then two other, uh, I would imagine, right wingers. Uh, and how they've been censored. They have no, they've been completely censored, except for, of course, this movie. Yeah, how they distributed the movie. And uh, <laughs> there's a great uh, clip of Gavin sort of um, driving and talking about the hardship that he's been going through um, in his, uh, his, his um, wealthy sub suburb. We'll, we'll play it tomorrow. But there's also a uh, Vic Berger version, one. which is really, which is even better. Um, fuck you forever. That's my common quote I say. It's fuck you forever. We're done. That's my common quote I say. Fuck you forever. We're done. Um, oh, this was interesting. Uh, last night, Pete Buttigieg was doing a 
uh, Fox Town Hall. And um, he did so. And I just want to say this. Uh, Pete Buttigieg understands that there is a problem going on a network like Fox. I don't know if he came up with this idea himself. It may have been from pushback when he announced that he was going on. He understands that there was a problem, and so he had to go on there and show his bona fides in terms of calling out that network. Pete Buttigieg has made similar smart moves lately. Uh, he was going to, I guess, go on Dave Rubin's show, and then somehow he found out that uh, Mike Cernovich was going to be on that show, and uh, he decided... Um, not to go on. Now, who could blame him? Um, because, you know, Mike Cernovich is a, a smear artist who, and here, Matt, uh, just put this up, because I'm not sure, not 100% sure how um, Buttigieg, uh, Buttigieg's people found out that um, Cernovich was going on that day. Um, it's, it's hard to know how these things get public. Oh, what's this? this? Is a tweet? Oh, I guess I now I remember. I asked uh, if Pete Buna, uh, Buttigieg knew that um, date rape denier and smear merchant Mike Cernovich was going to be on his show that day. I don't because we heard a rumor that that was the case. It turned out it was, but it wasn't. Um, it's, it's a booking a, thing, Pete. Yeah, I mean, here's the thing. Do you really want? to accept an invitation to a show right after Mike Cernovich has been on that show and not on that show to be indicted for his work, but rather as a reformation project. I would love to know the backstory of how that happened because some people say Cernovich are working with um, uh, turning points. I don't know if that's true. And I know that Dave Rubin was just at a turning points event Maybe maybe that was just a suggestion. Anyways, let's get back to Pete Buttigieg on uh, Fox News, where he realized, like, you can't go on platforms that are designed to uh, promote some of the uh, worst aspects of society and at the very least not address it. And... Uh, here is Buttigieg doing that. The other thing we've got to do is we've got to find people where they are. You know, a lot of folks in my party were critical of me for even doing this uh, with Fox News. And, and I've, I, I've heard that. <laughs> and, and I get where that's coming from, especially when you see what goes on with some of the opinion hosts on this network. I mean, when you got Tucker Carlson saying that immigrants make America dirty, when you've got uh, Laura Ingram comparing detention centers with children in cages to summer camps, summer camps, then there is a reason why anybody has to swallow hard and think twice before participating in this media ecosystem. But I also believe that even though some of those hosts are not always there in good faith, I think a lot of people tune into this network uh, who do it in good faith. And, and there are a lot of Americans who my party can't blame if they are ignoring our message because they will never hear it if we don't go on and talk about it. And so it's why, whether it's going into uh, the viewership of Fox News or whether geographically it's going into places uh, where Democrats haven't been seen much, I think we've got to find people where they are, not change our values, but update our vocabulary so that we're truly connecting with Americans from coast to coast. Now, I mean, I think, you know, and there's, there's obviously an argument like, well, um, maybe you should also deliver certain material benefits to those people as opposed to messaging. But let's just keep it on the messaging front. The reason why Pete Buttigieg would do Fox and has to throw that in so that he acknowledges on Fox what these people are doing, as opposed to Dave Rubin, is that, look, Dave Rubin, you're not reaching anybody who you couldn't reach through Fox and or through uh, all the other mainstream outlets. So there's a fundamental difference there in that calculation. Now, Dave Rubin obviously thinks very highly about his, um, his reach uh, and who he is reaching. And certainly, uh, at least if you believe the numbers on YouTube, now I know there's a lot of people out there who say things like, hey, can't you buy YouTube views? I just Googled 
buy YouTube views and you can buy YouTube views. I don't know if that's the case, um, but let's just assume it's not the case. Let's just assume that YouTube keeps demonetizing Dave Rubin's videos, according to him, for no reason whatsoever. That maybe has nothing to do with having paid views or maybe nothing to do with what those audience members had watched before that tells the algorithm this material might be very, very um, ad unfriendly, even though on its face it doesn't appear to be. Do you follow what I'm saying there? Like, for instance, I'm convinced that the YouTube algorithm knows where our audience has been. Oh, yeah. And if our audience, say, was watching a lot of hate videos and they came and watched my video with Peter uh, Dow, I'm convinced that they would that Google would automatically demonetize because they can't tell what I'm saying with Peter Dow. They just know that, like, if these guys are watching four hate videos a day and they go to watch the fifth video, there's good reason to believe that fifth video might be a little bit dubious. And that seems to work. Now, I don't know. I don't know. Um, I'm, this is all speculation. Or like point. maybe those are recent changes. And until quite recently, it was like, oh, the fifth hate video. That's excellent. Let's yeah. monetize it. This I don't does know. incredibly well for I don't know. algorithms. But for some reason, Dave Rubin's stuff gets demonetized a lot if you uh, believe his Twitter feed. But also, according to his Twitter feed, he gives congratulations to Media Matters, Vox, and HuffPo because Pete Buttigieg is passing on our interview. Um, he goes on to say it's a shame because I think he's a decent man and we have some agreement and some disagreement. We could have opened up a whole new audience to him. I don't think there is a whole new audience to him. I don't that's, think so. Uh, a whole new world. But, and, um, and I think that uh, he as a politician has a very good assessment as to whether it would have been a net uh, positive There's or negative. There's a couple negative. of 19-year-old chronic <laughs> masturbators who game and think black people are genetically but inferior. But I think it's unfair the whole field. of Dave to, um, to say, to, to thank Media Matters, Vox, and HuffPo for two reasons. One, it's, it's clearly um, not a function of them just saying, don't do it. It's them saying, like, look who you're having on, Dave. And also, like, to not give me credit, I think is also a little offensive. Now, let me just also dispel one other theory. There were people who have, uh, who have DM'd me and have uh, emailed me who say that they believe Dave had Mike Cernovich on as a way of telling me to F off because he did it he booked him right after those series of questions, why won't you talk to Sam Cedar in public that were videotaped? And there has been some speculation that Mike Cernovich, now I just want to say, that did not work out for you, Dave. I was happy to see what happened, but you made a decision to go for the clicks and maybe there's money in it for you in some fashion or another to have Mike Cernovich on. I mean, because you've had him on before. It's not like Cernovich has done anything new. I don't know what ideas you're talking about with Mike Cernovich. You didn't question him on uh, his role in his biggest failure to date. Uh, which was his work with me. It's interesting that he talked about the James... That he. I, I listened to that full interview and uh, Ruben talked as if he was going to get into all the things that you've been doing since then. Some are controversial, like trolling. Got deep into the James Gunn thing. It didn't mention the Sam Cedar thing. Yeah, a little weird about that because um, it wasn't like it didn't get written up in the New York Times and the Washington Post. Well, on his Wikipedia, there is a conflict with Sam Cedar section. There's not a conflict with James Gunn section. That's weird. But that's fake news. And, but uh, I'm more interested in talking about but, ideas. Instead but of Dave, thinking. let me just say this. Sorry about Pete Buttigieg. <laughs> it's a real shame that you don't have me on. Because maybe we could agree about some stuff. <laughs> maybe uh, some of your audience would be interested in hearing from me. Oh, no. Agreement. So you don't have to do this whole thing where you... 
go and book people who tried to get me fired publicly and then ended up being humiliated. That whole like games play. You can just be straight with me and ask me to come on. Don't if be you're coy. trying to get my attention, mission accomplished. I will come on, Dave. You just have to you just have to say the words. I think if I remind him of his greatest modern professional accomplishment, he'll get the message to not fuck with me anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, I seem to have miscalculated. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> Wait, it didn't have its intended effect on Cedar, and now I don't get to talk with Mayor Pete. Uh, no. I lost the battle and the war. Hmm. All right. I need to read more ideas. Um, so we have this uh, uh, interview with um, Bernie Sanders in uh, the New York Times by Sidney Ember. I don't know who she is. She is ahistorical and immoral. But I, I mean, I like, but that's a description. I don't know who she actually is. Um, some hack. But she interviewed uh, Bernie Sanders, and it was a very um, strange interview um, where she was asking about, um, it was an interview ostensibly about his long-held opposition to war um, and his support for socialist leaders. You don't really get into the support of specific leaders per se, uh, but certainly uh, support or defense against regimes. But it's interesting. It's interesting to take this assignment because when you say long-held opposition to war, the implication is this is going to be historical, right? Like I'm going to look back on Bernie Sanders' opposition to war and how that played out through different eras. But... Bernie Sanders' opposition to war is necessarily going to be tied to specific involvement by the United States with other countries. And if you don't know any of that, if you're not aware of even the basic rudimentary history or you pretend you're not for the sake of the interview, uh, things are going to get a little bit uh, weird. Like she says... Um, she apparently went back to the Wire report. She's talking about um, the rally that he attended in Managua. Um, this is when, in Nicaragua, the U.S. government was trying to overthrow the Nicaraguan government. Uh, ended up supporting all sorts of like wonderful enterprises like death squads, that would end up killing nuns. I mean, stuff like that, right? Like almost like a parody of horrible things that you could do. And um, very often activists would go to these countries to draw attention to what was happening there. And so she um, said, uh, in the top of our story, we talk about the rally you attended in Managua and a wire report at the time said that there were anti-American chants from the crowd. Now understand, the U.S. government is funding millions and millions and millions of dollars to create right-wing death squads that are killing people. And the closer you are, the, the, the closer proximity you have to that happening, the more you are aware of what the United States was doing. May I just add really briefly, this is also on top of the Sandinistas got into power deposing a vicious dictator that we backed called Somoza and calling for, like, relieving poverty. Yep. And um, there was an amazing story. I'm trying to remember this about what happened after a major earthquake there and the way that Somoza rebuilt. I can't remember. I mean, this is stuff all that I, you know, was dealing with in, in, in college quite a bit, actually. But because um, it was uh, many, it was almost contemporaneous. And... Um, but it was not getting much publicity in the mainstream media. So, you know, when people went down there to support it, uh, to, at the very least, not necessarily even support or support the Sandinistas against the United States. Um, <clears throat> this is the question. There was a wire report that said there were anti-American chants from the crowds. And so Bernie's like, uh, the United States at that time, I don't know how much you know about this, was actively supporting the Contras to overthrow the government. 
So that's theirs anti-American sentiment. Now, I don't, they misspelled theirs there. It's weird. Like that's their anti-American sentiment. Yeah. I, I wonder what's going on with that. But it, I mean, I, I saw this and it just stuck out to me. Like, why would they misspell that? But that's their anti-American sentiment, question mark. I remember that. I remember that event very clearly. And she says, do you recall hearing those chants? This is the, like, you were sitting in the pew with Reverend Wright. Do you remember hearing his, what he was saying? She says, I think the wire report has them saying, here, there, everywhere, the Yankee will die. And he says, they were fighting against Americans. Uh, yeah, what's your point? I wanted to, are you shocked to learn there was anti-American sentiment? <laughs> My point was, I wanted to know if you heard that. I don't remember. No, of course there was anti-American sentiment there. This was a war being funded by the United States against the people of Nicaragua. People were being killed in that war. But she cannot let go. Do you think if you had heard that directly, you have stayed at the rally? And he's like, I think, Sydney, with all due respect, you don't understand a word that I'm saying. <laughs> like, what part of nun rape do you not understand? This is just like... Part the, of literally the whole idea, villages like wiped if out. If you wanted to really examine his position, the idea that four of your questions would be dedicated to hearing an anti-American chant and then not removing yourself from the area is absurd because he's conceding. I was in the country. The entire country felt an anti-American sentiment because of what America was doing. I was there because of what America's doing. Have you heard of jingoism? Jesus. Um, have, you, have you bothered to read the Wikipedia entry on the Contras uh, before bothering me with these stupid questions? So now she wants to get into, have you changed your perspective on Daniela Ortega? So she says, do you believe you had an accurate view of President Ortega at the time? And he goes, this was not about Ortega. Do you understand? I, I don't know if you do or not. I don't do you know that the United States overthrew the government of Chile a while back? Do you know, do you, do you know that? I'm, do you? I'm asking you a simple question. And she says, what point do you want to make? <laughs> I mean, this is clearly an attempt. And, and, and I, I would have lost it at this point. Uh, but he just goes on to explain, my point is fascism developed in Chile. As a result of that, the United States overthrew the government of Guatemala, a democratically elected government, overthrew the government of Brazil. I strongly oppose U.S. policy, which overthrows governments, especially democratically elected governments around the world. So the issue is not so much Nicaragua or the government of Nicaragua. The issue was, should the United States continue a policy of overthrowing governments in Latin America and Central America? I believe that in, then that it was wrong. I believe today that it's wrong. That's why I do not believe the United States should overthrow the government of Venezuela. I'm wondering if now you view Ortega and the government differently knowing what you do now. Well, this is 30 years later, right? Something like that. I'm very concerned about the anti-democratic policies of the Ortega government, yes. <laughs> right. So, and this apparently is a view that this reporter cannot comprehend. That one can both think that a government in country X is not good. Flawed. Flawed. 30 years later, even worse. And fact, a totally different and, government. <laughs> and the United States should not intervene. Both those things can exist equally. I mean, that's, of course, and it's stunning the lack of just like basic ability to make basic distinctions, but obviously they're trying to do a hatchet job. But the, but the other thing, though, that's just, and I see it in a range of reactions to this, because it's like one is like, oh, Bernie lost his temper. Uh, and, and that's like, you know, again, just the pure American narcissism where there's just like no regard for human lives overseas. There's no consideration. Like, I'm not saying that foreign policy or how we interact with the world needs to be your primary focus, right? But it is different. If you're voting in the United States, your vote registers across the planet. You can't, you know, it's, I'm sorry, it's not voting in Norway or something where you could say, hey, I don't know. I can primarily think of how we're going to handle business here. You have to think about your footprint in the rest of the world if you're voting in the United States. And the other thing 
I'm thinking of Michael Cohen, I think, is in the Boston Globe. Is that the columnist? Yeah. He had this tweet where he was just like, it was very disturbing that Bernie's just still doesn't see like the ability of the U.S. to do good overseas. Well, like this- coincidentally, yes. that's the name of his book. Well, there we go. I mean, I, it's like but literally just, just the good American- This is an adult day. that writes about foreign policy, literally with a, fa- with a fairy tale. Like, it's not even, I mean, because it's like even that frame, like when we do happen to do good overseas- it's going to be because it's synchronized with other interests that we have overseas. This idea that you could be a an adult writing about foreign policy. And then Jennifer Rubin did the whole like, you know, he says he's studying, but he's still not serious. Because for her, serious still means willingness to kill a lot of people and start a lot of wars. I, I also think that even like, even if like not only is the argument that when we do good, it aligns with our interests, which I think is fine. I think that's okay. But that's an adult Um, way of looking at it, is what I'm saying. And I think that, I do think that it's not necessarily naive to say that doing good aligns with our interest more than a lot of countries, okay? Because of the nature of the way that we are built. And I think that's okay. But none of that, none of that in any way um, is uh, negated by pointing out the severely bad things that we have done with our power. And do. And, and do. And it's not even like, it doesn't even matter what the net is. There is no reason. None of these policies were necessary for us to do the good things. Well, that's the other irony of this. And I, and I have some concerns because I'm at a point, I, you know, following Dar- uh, Daniel Bessner, I really am wary of any type of humanitarian intervention rhetoric at all, not objecting to abuses overseas, whether it's in Brazil or China, obviously, but I, I don't, I I don't like interventionism period. I think that's really proven, particularly in Libya. Right. But even if you were interested in just the intellectual, you know, exercise of it, some of the objections from certain people on the left to what Bernie's trying to navigate is he's trying to synthesize actually a certain kind of liberal critique, of there's a new rise of right wing authoritarianism, we need to confront it with a sort of left position against anti interventionism. And I think in some ways, you know, Tulsi Gabbard sort of doing this, you know, more of like a right left alliance on anti intervention. Those are both different ways of thinking about foreign policy that you could debate and talk about. But what's so interesting is they're so blind and so have no historical awareness that they can't even get the areas where Bernie's trying to make overtures. <laughs> in Dead some ass. ways to people like that in terms of talking about an axis that connects Trump and Hungary and Brazil and India. You know, that's the high end critique that people like Tim Schneider are supposed to be bringing forth. Those are their intellectual right. gurus. Yeah. They're not even taking them yeah. seriously. And can we yeah. talk about the media response for a second? Like Jill Filipovic tweeted, I get being frustrated by reporters, but Bernie here is shockingly rude to uh, what's her name, who's just trying to do her job. We already have a president who attacks the press, condescends, and refuses to answer questions he deems <laughs> stupid. Now, she's awful. Point one, like we said earlier, it's tone tone policing conceals the content, which is actually the thing that we should have an issue with. But also, when she's saying, "Oh, she's just doing her job," no, she isn't. Well, like a journalist's job is to speak truth to power. Well, the question is at that point, what is her job? I mean, well, if she's yes. just doing her job, the question has to be like, what is your job? I mean, it, it, is is it really our four questions out of the eight or ten that are asked there about whether he heard anti-American chants at a rally? I mean, is that real? I mean, what I would job? suggest. Yeah, I mean, I should say do, I would a journalist's job is supposed to be to speak truth to power. I would say that, and even, when they're not doing that, when they are on the side of power, it's your job to but, speak truth to them. But even if she's just like, you know, doing like, I'm just trying to, um, uh, you know, to give people a better understanding of his foreign policy. That's not it. You could just as easily say, it, "Oh no, her job." begins with reading the Wikipedia entry on this country. And if she wanted to critique him, she could totally say, well, didn't you, I mean, I don't, I feel hesitate to give talking (laughs) points, but didn't you realize by the mid eighties that the right position was to, 
you know, a pox on both houses and find some obscure diplomatic initiative that probably didn't even matter, but was opposed to the Sandinistas and the Contras and say, didn't you want to not in line with either the U.S. Right. or the Soviets in a proxy war? You know, you could do all sorts of convoluted nonsense that at least would require him to respond forcefully. This is just the right. most jingoistic, shallow garbage. Right. Uh, and and pretending to be otherwise. Right, totally. That, that's the, she that's gave him smarmy. Fox content with right. NPR. Form. That's the that's the uh, that's the problem. There and, was a, and I mean I mean you could say it was rude of Pete Buttigieg to go on Fox and mock the Fox hosts that weren't there. That was rude, but of course not. You, you wouldn't do that because you support what he's doing. Well, it put Mike Wallace in a really unfair position. I totally. mean, regardless of what you think of Laura Ingram and Tucker Carlson, and, and by the way, I oppose both of them. I think they're terrible. But I think when you're there and they're not in the room with right. Mike Wallace, who's trying to do a fair job and who all right. of us can I respect I mean, if anybody wrote that, we would laugh them off of the... the, the, the Those are his colleagues, whether we like it or not. There was a uh, Ben Rhodes profile, May 5th, 2016, in New York Times Magazine. This quote was in it uh, where he said... Um, most of the outlets are reporting on world events from Washington. The average reporter we talk to is 27 years old, and their only reporting experience consists of being around political campaigns. That's a sea change. They literally know nothing. And people yeah. were upset about him saying that. That just seems accurate. Yeah. It's objectively true. All right. Uh, here is Bernie on, um, on Chuck Todd's program, I guess presumably following uh, this line of, uh, of question. I mean, they're going to, you know, people knew that they would do this. Uh, but then they tried to do it to funny enough to build de Blasio in New York. Now the, the whole country is not New York. Uh, and they talked about how Bill de Blasio went down to hang out with the Sandinistas. Uh, Solidified my but, vote. But it, I mean, that's why it backfires in New York around the country. The reason why it's going to fail is not because people are like, man, he was with the Sandinistas. I'm down for that. The reason why is because, just like the New York Times reporter who didn't seem to have a clue, the rest of the country is going to be like, the Sanda what? The Sanders? Bernie Sanders? Is that Ozone? There was a, oh, there, the Sanders Nistas. Is that a baseball oh, my The God. Sanders Nistas. There was the a group in Nicaragua over. that was inspired by his leadership in Burlington. People are literally. And he went and visited there. People, That's cool. People are literally going to be, if they hear like the Sandinistas, are going to assume that it's like, Oh, those must be what they call like if you're a supporter of Bernie Sanders, you're a Sandinista or, or something. Or maybe like oh, I don't think that people oh, know. That's what that Clash album people, was about. Like, Bernie like the Clash. People are not gonna know. People are just not gonna know. Like I think most of the people who Fuck say the Easter cash don't know that it like that that that's the coinage. Like even. And but here is so I don't think Three, it's going to be terribly oh, effective. But if you're in Washington D.C., and I mean that just sort of if that's your state of mind, uh, if you are with the foreign policy establishment, you think that this is going to be damaging. When in fact, the percentage of Americans who, sadly, I'm sorry, Michael, care about foreign policy is extremely narrow extremely narrow we've got and to work then to change that the percentage of americans broadly speaking who know who uh, the sandinistas are or were sadly because then they would know who the contras were and they would know what uh, this country did but that's the case is even narrower but here's bernie sanders on with um with chuck dot things I think the larger question well, and I, I, I let me let me just frame the question this way the larger yeah. question is going to be if you're the nominee whether you like it or not, the right's going to basically hammer and sickle you to death. How do you prevent it? Well, I, I don't mind the right wing doing it, but I, I understand they will do it. I don't want the media to do it. Look, I, when I was a young man, I plead guilty. I voted, I, I worked hard as a young man against the war in Vietnam. I don't apologize for that. As a United, member of the United States House, I helped lead the, the effort against the war in Iraq, which turns out to have been the worst foreign policy blunder in the modern history of the United States. As a United States Senator, I led the effort to pass a bipartisan resolution to get America out of the war in Yemen, led by Saudi Arabia, which, and I got to tell you something, Chuck, I hope you guys pay attention to Yemen. Mm -hmm. What's going on in Yemen now is the worst 
humanitarian disaster in the world. We're talking about hundreds of thousands yep. of people, children yep. Yep. dying. Uh, and I'm doing my best to get the U.S. out of that war. And if Trump wants to go to war in Iran, that will make the war in Iraq look like a cakewalk. It will make it. So we've got to do everything we can to stop that. If people want to attack me because I think that war should be the last resort, you can attack me. But I've seen too much horror. I was the chairman of the Senate Committee on Veterans Affairs. I talked to too many veterans whose yeah. lives were destroyed by the war in Iraq. I will do everything I can to see problem solved diplomatically rather than through war. Now, that, that's a great response. But the other, the alternate response you could do to the question of how are you going to stop them from uh, painting you with the hammer and sickle should be no one's going to care. No one's going to care. Hammer and what now? Right, exactly. Like they are, there is a mentality that exists in the um, in the conventional establishment journalistic worldview that there is some resonance to the uh, Soviet threat, and I mean, here's the the reality, folks. We are close to thirty years out. From when the wall fell. And even for people in my age who were, uh, I was like 25 maybe, 27, somewhere around there. I can't do the math right now, 27. Even for my generation, the threat of the Soviet Union was still not like, you know, uh, the only example we have was Reagan. And as soon as Reagan said some bad, you know, some mean words to them, it, it just went away. And also, so there was no like, no, you know, I didn't have to go underneath my desk as a kid. Right. The generation that came before me did. And the generation before them did. And that's why this had some resonance. There was a red scare here, but not that happened 20 years, 20, you know, 10 years before I was born. And also, not and, only did he say bad words to them, I mean, I, there was a period of time, seems like, I know that you would know way better than me, but it seems like in the 80s, not, I mean, yes, by the second half of the Reagan administration, the, you know, Gorbachev and Reagan are cutting right. arsenals. They're negotiating deals. The guy does a Pizza Hut ad right. not that many years later. Right. So, I mean, this is just like, again, it's the same thing as we used to talk about with, with Barack Obama and Chicago politics. Nobody knows what that means. Nobody knows what that means. Can I also just say it is what I mean? It is, I'm sorry. Obviously, I'm totally in the tank for Bernie. But like, when is the last time you have a candidate on national television saying, incidentally, all these dumb got you questions. Let me not only defend myself, but maybe I'll use it as an example to highlight the fact that you never cover a genocide that the United States is supporting right now in the right. Middle East. And, you know, Bernie does a lot of that. And I also, you know, an uh, anti uh, an abortion activist noted on Twitter the other day that Bernie's campaign is sending out fundraisers to support actual grassroots local groups fighting this stuff in places like Alabama. Hell no yeah. other campaigns. Yeah. Doing and that. they're doing strike support. Yep. They're doing strike support for grad students everywhere they go. And they always foreground local. I mean, they had an anti-gentrification activist in Chicago. It was one of his opening speakers. It is a truly intersectional campaign. But he could get hammered and sickled. But I got news for you. Anybody, what are you, a memorabilia connected, Chuck? The majority of people who understand the hammer and sickle, they're just not going to vote for the Democrat regardless. Yeah. They're not going to vote because they're... Um, they're a uh, woman or they're not going to vote because they're going to be too friendly to the blacks or whatever it is. I mean, the uh, to the extent that you're going to lose any people over the hammer and sickle, it is um, it is not a cohort that is in play. Yeah, no. People whose brains have been poisoned by Fox News think every Democrat is a communist. All right. I mean, that's the other great. Thing. Lastly, um, what is it? What if I was to tell you a little story about an heir to a frozen food fortune who looked upon a woman who escaped incredible deprivation and civil war, 
traveled thousands of miles to escape um, this country that was suffered a famine too, I believe, um, made it after years to the United States, worked hard, learned English, actually did so well in her community that she became a congresswoman. When you look at these two examples, one who is traded in on his um, millions of dollars that he is um, going to inherit and all the connections that come with being that wealthy to sit in front of a TV, be on every single network, continually failing upwards, launched an online uh, publishing um, platform supposedly because conservatives were in the gutter. And he wanted to show that conservatives could do real journalism that ended up doing all sorts of like, um, you know, uh, semi naked model stories and then just gutter journalism. Um, would you imagine that that guy would feel so embarrassed by himself relative to this former refugee that he would go on his TV show and malign her as a bad immigrant? Well, if you had imagined, get yourself a cookie, because that's what happened on Tucker Carlson. But for the left, whether the country benefits is not the point. Congresswoman Ilhan Omar, herself a symbol of America's failed immigration system, if there ever was one, someone who hates this country, coming here at public expense, spent yesterday demanding the abolition of ICE, the decriminalization of illegal immigration itself, and an end to all deportation programs. She demands open borders, the unlimited arrival of anyone who wants to come to America, whether they have anything to contribute or not. And by the way, you get to pay for it. And if you don't want to, you're a bigot. Well, you know what this is really about. Of course, it's not about civil rights. That's a joke. It's about money and power, their money, their power. The left has aligned with business interests that profit from cheap, obedient workers. Low-skilled immigrants have a harder time assimilating into the American mainstream. They stay poorer. They learn English more slowly. They're more likely to remain an ethnic underclass, all of which makes them much more likely to vote Democratic long term. That's the point, obviously. Well, first of all, the idea that she is an example of the failed immigration system, I can't possibly imagine a system that you would want that would bring in um, um, any uh, other type of immigrants. But uh, first of all, his data is all wrong. Well, he's not offering any data. He's just offering opinions. But the fact is, that's not, it's simply not true. Uh, what businesses want is an underclass of workers, which you would get through like a temporary worker program, or you would get through undocumented workers just being allowed to be in the country without having a path to citizenship so they don't have access to labor laws. If Tucker Carlson's really worried about the American worker, he should be every night hammering the Republicans for their attacks on unions, for their attacks on labor laws. He should be talking about how Donald Trump rolled back the time and a half initiative that the Obama administration. There's plenty of things that he can be talking about. And he should be talking about a path to citizenship for every single one of the 11 million undocumented immigrants in this country or immigrants who've overstayed their visas. That's what he should be hammering for, because as soon as that happens, that's going to um, they're going to take them out of the shadows and they're not going to be able to be exploited. But guess what? That work is still going to need to be done. And so uh, all his facts are wrong. The fact of the matter is, is that we know that even undocumented immigrants increase uh, labor participation because they're doing work and freeing up other work for other people to go and do work. Um, all of the things he's talking about are myths. And there is a lot of, uh, and talk about bank shots. If you want to help the American worker, then just help the American worker. But the idea that uh, you're going to pick and choose which immigrants are going to come on and you're going to be able to pick and choose which immigrants are not going to, are not going to be competitive with uh, Americans for jobs. I mean, these are the ones who always talk about unintended consequences. We know the consequence of the immigration proposals uh, of, of immigration that we've had in this country traditionally, and it has helped this country dramatically. And he wants to suddenly go to some type of pick and choose thing where who's going to pick these things? Government bureaucrats or businesses, corporations that want to undercut skilled workers. That's the, it's the classic. I mean, who's going to do this? Right. 
That is we all and, and it's the classic method that he always identifies certain problems that are real. Then he goes and and race baits and and you know demonizes immigrants. And then after that process is done, you realize like, oh, he began that segment by <laughs> correctly saying something about Amazon as an example. And nothing that would do anything to undermine right. Amazon's undermining of our democracy yeah. and total all power. Did he say all he did was just incite against Ilan Omar or, you know, attack Ilan Omar or, you know, demonize immigrants? That is it's such an important point to hammer on. And like he's he's kind of right. It's never going to be enough for the left to just say, oh, if you don't support immigrants, you're a racist. Like there are very real reasons. Uh, that we need to support a more open border policy, demilitarize the border, decriminalize migration. And I think even on the left, there's not necessarily a consensus on that. Like, I think some people still want to paint this as part of some neoliberal plan when, in fact, uh, they cracked down on migration as a direct result of NAFTA in the 90s because Clinton needed to reassure people that these powerful push factors weren't going to be able to create a wave of immigration. And the 1996 immigration stuff was when they started using the term criminal alien. Right. And that was all just the 90s Republican race baiting. Plus, I think they did it after NAFTA because they needed to keep uh, people inside Mexico for all these new sweatshop jobs that they had created. Like anti-immigrant policy is neoliberal policy. And we need to hammer on that point. All right, folks, we got time for one more phone call and then we got to go. Call from a 310 area code. Who's this? Where are you calling from? I think, is it, is this me? It is you. What is your name? Where are you calling from? Oh my from? gosh, I finally, I finally get to be the one to say it. Um, my name is Lauren and I'm calling from Ventura, California. Cool. And I just wanted to talk about uh, Social Security and Medicare because uh, you talk about it a lot and I am... Um, lucky or unlucky enough to be someone who is young and receiving social security and therefore Medicare. So I just wanted to sort of mention that, that I exist, you know, I'm only 28 and you always talk about like, you know, the old people who are on social security, but there are um, a lot of people who are young, who have disabilities, who are on social security and get Medicare. It's actually 16% of the Medicare population is people who are not retirement age. So I just wanted to sort of, um, mention that and then also talk about uh, drug prices because I have been, um, I have like a condition that no doctors have ever experienced before. And so because of that, I've been trying all these like crazy drugs. There's one drug that I am on that costs $14,880 a month. And the only way to get, um, the only way to get the drug, like I get it for free now because I was able to like they charge that amount to me, Medicare doesn't cover it, and then they are like, oh, you you qualify for our assistance program, and then then your copay is seven hundred and forty four dollars, and I'm like, okay, well I paid it once, and then I can't pay for it, and then they're like, okay, well so now that you really can't pay for it, we'll give it to you for free, but it's like you have to just like do all this crazy stuff to show that you are deserving of drugs, and then you have to like you know sign all these people come to the door with the drug and I have to sign like three things for it and send back something in the mail. And it's, it's really, it's, it's really insane. And, um, so the, so you've got to prove that you're basically completely tapped out until they will give you the drug. And then, um, they do this as a way of basically probably relieving some measure of, of, of pressure to regulate the, the cost of that drug. Yeah, I mean, and it's it's crazy because that's just for my my pain medication drugs, and then I have all these like dermatological drugs that I I use too. Those cost hundreds and hundreds of dollars, and there's no relief for those. And it's it's really it's incredible. And I was just um, you know listening to Democracy Now today, and they were talking about um, prescription drug related things about how generics are like not the real drug a lot of the times, and that's why the cost can be lower. And I'm just so scared now that like these compound pharmacies, I'm, I'm finding all these like mail, mail order, mail order pharmacies to get my drugs. From. And I'm like, well, then maybe I won't even get the right drug now from the, and it's just, it's, it's crazy. If we could just have something like uh, Warren's been talking about, you know, having the government manufacture drugs and have them be safe and not from like some back alley in China or something like or wherever our drugs come from now. But um, yeah, well, no, you it's know, really, it's really insane having to deal with this. I interviewed, um, um, I've interviewed um, 
uh, people at the uh, the tort conference in, in Vegas I go to who had a story um, who told me that a lot of times what happens is the active ingredients are, are, are manufactured in China where there is sometimes dubious regulation about, um, about where they're manufactured and how they're manufactured. One was like, I think, uh, manufactured close to a jet fuel plant and there was some type of problem. And, um, and then it gets sent back to the States and um, they just take the inactive ingredients, combine it into capsule form and sell it. Um, I mean, and then there's also, I think, like even like third tier, like you're mentioning, where they will um, basically just reconstitute this stuff and become a drug company overnight, essentially, uh, and sell this stuff. I mean, it's a problem. I, I, I mean, I'm with you. We should have um, we should have tighter controls and there's no reason the VA does this apparently already when there's a shortage of drugs, generic drugs, the VA will actually produce these drugs. So we already have a U.S. government capacity and program where we do this. There's no reason why we can't expand it. Um, there's just no reason. The, the government is capable of doing this. And, uh, but just, uh, uh, I mean, I'm aware of SSDI. Uh, this is the Social Security Disability Insurance. Um, mm -hmm. What's been your experience with it? Because I know it's one of those things that uh, for a while, certainly under Obama, maybe it's the pressure has eased off. There was an attempt to... Um, to say that fraud was rampant and uh, it is a fund that is the least funded of all of, uh, of, of Social Security, as it were. Um, but what was your sense? I mean, how hard was it for you to to uh, to receive SSDI? Well, what's interesting, actually, is that, you know, before becoming disabled a few years ago, one of my previous jobs had been working at a law firm that specialized in getting people social security disability. So I happened to come into this knowing exactly how to go about it. But I will say that I know from all the clients that um, were at the, that I, that I dealt with at the firm I worked at um, it's, it's very, very difficult to get a disability um, especially when you're young, like myself, but I mean, because what you end up having to do, it's like, you know, you jump through all these hoops, and then generally most people don't get, don't receive disability off the application. I was lucky enough to be able to receive it off the application because I guess I'm, they're just like, wow, she's really disabled, which is both, you know, a blessing and a curse, obviously, because, you know, my life, you know, sucks because of it with all these uh, pills I have to take and the prices and blah, blah, blah. But at least, at least Social Security recognizes um, that I'm disabled. But, but yeah, I mean, it's a really, really difficult program to get through. And I am sorry, one of my problems is uh, short-term memory loss. I, I know you asked a question. I don't remember if I answered it. No, you did. Um, you answered it extremely yeah. precisely. Okay. Uh, well, listen, I appreciate your calling in. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm sorry for what you're going through. And, uh, but, uh, you know, hopefully we will, um, we will get there with drugs. We have uh, next week, I have author Catherine Eben on, uh, who is uh, going to be on to talk about generic drugs um, and, uh, awesome. and prices. So uh, appreciate the call. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thanks. Bye-bye. All right, folks. That's it for today. We will see you tomorrow. Sorry, other callers. Bye. It might take all the strength I got. To get to where I want But I know somehow I'm gonna get there I wasn't looking when I just got caught Between the truth and the light bar But finding out won't make me feel any better Yeah, I know the clock is ticking But the meds are gonna kick in Choice was made for the option where you don't get paid for the road that bends before it finally breaks you. I guess somehow I lost my drive between the 101 and the 5. Do you know how far the detour takes you?